You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 133, live from San Antonio. I'm the layman, Trey Strickman, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, you're in San Antonio, my home state. Look at everybody. We got people here in front of us. <laughs> yeah, in we person. do. Yes, we do. We have live people. This is, this is awesome. It's, it's good to have live people. It is. Yeah. And, and we've been doing shows all week, but this is our first show that we actually get to do, that I actually get to talk, because normally when you're interviewing somebody, I just sit there like... right. Look, with my mouth shut because <laughs> I don't have anything intelligent to say. Those are great shows, too. Yeah, those are the best. Right, <laughs> right. right. I'm sure everybody just fast forwards through my parts and just gets to you. That's yeah. I see how that is. No, but, uh, well, we went to um, see the movie of The Arrival last night. I don't know if anybody's seen that movie. Yeah, but anybody seen that? You can say. All right, we won't give away any spoilers. Yeah, we won't spoil it, but uh, did you like it? I did. I did. It's It's pretty heady. Uh, have, have any of you have seen uh, the old Jodie Foster movie Contact? It, it's like that. I I I don't think it's as good, but it's it's good. But that's that's kind of what you're looking at. It's not Independence Day, All right? It's like <laughs> Burnett. You love you love Independence Day. <laughs> yeah, we also have David Burnett here. So, any questions? targeted towards david you know let you know ask him we're here so well, i'll defer some to david how's that <laughs> sounds good all right I'll well hand him off do we just want to get straight to the questions sure all right do you want me to just go around the table brie are you all right I, if I we really start with you or do you want me to go the other way or brian chris you up you want you want to start you have a question or which way you want me to go who wants to be on the spot first we're gonna let brian brian got here super <laughs> early to help us get the loft here in rosella coffee shop downtown san antonio give them a shout out so Brian got here early, so we're going to let Brian start it. Mike, my question is, I guess, more about just uh, application, Mm -hmm. present-day application to this information. Um, I guess in more of a worship context and how biblical uh, authors kind of viewed worship uh, and how we view it is probably two different things. I know the example of like Psalters were like an Old Testament priestly leaders of like Jericho, but they were like warring too. And so uh, how do we put this into present day context, this information about the gods? And are, could we be worshiping other gods and not even realizing it? Sometimes I, I know idols exist in like occult settings and stuff, but could idols be on TV? Could idols just be in, in, in stuff that these gods inhabit and Mm -hmm. we need to kind of view that as serious and how do we apply what you're teaching here to just our everyday life is kind Mm -hmm. of my example is my question dave did you hear that okay because i'd be interested because you know you had you pastored for a while too i'd be interested in hearing your take on this too yeah Yeah. um well i I think i I think at some level you i mean you you all know i'm I'm not going to abstract the gods so that they they aren't real you know into other things but there is something to be said for what you swap in, you know, to, you know, to worship in, in the sense of adoration. What what receives you know your attention? What do you trust in? I think is a big deal. We we've actually had a similar question on a Q and A uh, in an earlier episode where I talked about part of of uh, a, a sort of a worship status between you know an, an Israelite and God really relates to. What do I put my confidence in as far as who's going to sustain me, you know, in this day? Because they, they don't take a lot of things for granted uh, in terms of, you know, what they have to eat, what they have to drink, their personal safety, all this sort of stuff. So trust actually was a was a significant part of, you know, how a person thought about uh, Yahweh. And again, if, if you're not trusting in, in him and you're trusting in something else, either yourself or you're convinced for some reason to, to trust another deity. Well, that, there's an example of idolatry, even without you having to sort of go, you know, participate in some ritual, um, you know, at, at some cult location. So I, I do think that that's an element that we can see sort of a transferability in, in terms of, again, where, where our confident, confidence is for living. It's kind of interesting. 
also in that when we, we talked to N.T. Wright today, in his latest book, one of the things I wanted to, to kind of, you know, get some re- response out of him from or for was he talks about sin um, being really at its at its heart, uh, idolatry. Uh, he, you know, it's not so much I broke a rule. It's my loyalty is is toward another. Okay, and, and that can manifest in a variety of ways. So we talked a little bit about that because I thought it was interesting that he would would sort of you know funnel biblical talk about sin in that direction. And I, you know, I, I think that's you know a touch point too that we can talk about. You know, how do, how does God really look at us? I mean, if you remember, we've had a couple episodes on the podcast, including some Q and As, where we talked about you know, David. Okay, David was a mess. I mean, he, he commits all sorts of sins and some really horrible ones. But the thing he never do, does is he never, there's no question about his loyalty. So even though he's a screw-up in so many ways, he's never crossing the line where, oh, I maybe Yahweh isn't the God of God. You know, he, that, that's not even on the radar. So that that's a good example where God looks at at violations of, let's say, morality or something like that. And, and yes, they're wrong. Yes, they're violations of the law and whatnot. But the big focus, again, is who is your God? I mean, when it really comes down to it, where is your believing loyalty? And that, that directly relates to idolatry. So that I think that's another example of a, of a kind of thing if we were preaching. Instead of talking about sin in terms of breaking a rule, it's, you know, when push comes to shove, who are you trusting? Where is your believing loyalty? Because forgiveness is a factor there too. If you abandon your, your confidence in, in the Lord's forgiveness, that actually itself is sort of a form of idolatry. And you're putting yourself in the place of God as far as your, an assessment of, of your relationship with God. You, know, you sort of become the arbiter you know, of that relationship instead of trusting Him. So I, I, would, I would tend to apply it in those sorts of ways. I'd like to hear... Dave, what what you think? Yeah, I'm not sure if I would if I would go about it the same route. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when we when we ask questions of worship and idolatry, we got to be sure that if we're asking the questions of the biblical text, yeah, that we're using the categories that they're using. So when and I'm sure you've all heard this before. I grew up hearing this is uh, you when you hear sermons on idolatry, right? Normally what pastors will do with that and preachers will do with that is they'll say things like, um, you know, the money can be your idol, right? Or sex can be your idol or, you know, whatever. You've heard that, right? I mean, I have. I don't know. I've heard it all my life. But but when you the, – the biblical tradition doesn't – that's not idolatry. None of that stuff is idolatry. None of that stuff has anything to do with idolatry. So when we say, uh, well, can you make money your idol? No, you can't. Um can you make uh, sex an idol? No, you can't. You can't make your wife your idol. You can't make your children your idol. Just stop that language right now. <laughs> what? The, because idolatry, just like the term worship, and this is actually really mm-hmm. important, and I'm glad you paired those in a question, mm-hmm. because biblically this, this, this is a kind of a complicated issue, but I'm trying to simplify it. Idolatry always had to do with, and Mike, can, if, if you want to nuance this, you can, but Idolatry had to do with literal cultic worship of deities. Mm-hmm. So, if you, and what I mean by cultic uh, worship of deities, this has to do with what worship means. Mm-hmm. There's a debate in um, early Christian scholarship on whether the earliest Christians, the Jewish Jesus followers, actually worshiped Jesus. Now, for many Christians, they'd be like, what? How could you say that? But the, but the question, the way it's framed, is with these modern categories of what worship is, right? So like when we think of what worship is, it's like singing to God or like praising Jesus or whatever. But worship, ter- the terms for worship in in Greek in particular and then also into Hebrew, uh, the Greek term I'm thinking of is treskeia, which means cult. It means sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So you would bring offerings or sacrifices to deities. And that's what would frequently be called translated worship. Now, where this gets, why I said this is complicated is when you're reading your English translations of your Bibles, most English translations, and I don't really know any other English translations that don't do this. uh, Maybe I'm ignorant of one, but 
most English translations will translate that word treskea for cult that you offer to deities the same as they'll translate the word proskuneo, mm-hmm. which means to just bow down or fall prostrate. This is a big, big problem. Okay, for us in modern uh, reading modern English Bibles, what that causes us to do is when we see worship of idols like that have real gods behind them, we tend to equate that with other passages that are using proskuneo, which means just to bow down. Now, the pro- the, the reason why these are not the same things is because you can proskuneo uh, uh, a master of a household. Like if you're a slave, you just you can bow down prostrate before your master, right? Or it's something you do before a king. But it does not mean you're offering them cultic worship. Mm-hmm. So you see those terms, that's really important distinction when we talk about worship and idolatry. Because yeah, that, 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 that's good because what, what, I, what I was tracking on is essentially what do you think you're getting out of it? And you're, mm-hmm. yeah, you're, 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 yeah. you're, you're hitting the good, the distinction with the practices. Yeah. yeah I have to hit that up because yeah. I think it's one of the biggest, um, kind of exegetical failures of preachers mm-hmm. is that they, they don't know how to make those distinctions and it can confuse people because they're like, well, am I like worshiping idols if I like money a lot or something? You know? Yeah. It's like, no, you shouldn't like money and, a lot, but yeah, that's not since, what we would call idolatry. Right. And right. since, since that, since that that part of it's sort of taken off the table right and in terms of our modern application you know we do have to ask ourselves you know what what do we think we're getting out of this other stuff you know Mm -hmm. even though we can't strictly practice idolatry in the mode you know that they were doing right right it's it's like we we have to uh this is this is kind of an interesting me and mike have talked about this before uh it's this interesting problem where you have all these texts in the Old Testament talking about idolatry and New Testament, particularly in Paul, um, uh, that pastors want to make some readily a- quick application with, but mm-hmm. sometimes you just can't, and that's okay. Like, I mean, we we most of us grew up in the monotheistic West, where uh, it's not that people we have the reverse problem now. the pr- The problem in the West, it, it, the monotheistic West, is not the gods per se they don't believe in those anymore (laughs) it's like do you believe in god that's all people say right it's like do you believe in god well no i don't believe in god it's like no they have gods you know so that that's we have a kind of reverse problem in the west so i think it's almost impossible in the west to have idolatry um uh, in in the biblical sense uh Again, I, I know that it's difficult when we use these terms, but I just want to bring clarity to that because mm-hmm. I think that's such a confused topic. So I don't know if that's I, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. 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 In, in regard to oh, like the Korites, I, I'm, I'm actually Levites. I'm actually kind of interested in why you're asking that, but you can you can jump into that later. Um, so we get that on the. Uh, just, just uh, who were the Psalters, the the Korites, the people who wrote the Psalms? Mm-hmm. Like, what was the purpose of of even having Psalms back in the Old Testament and singing? And how did that relate to um, uh, giving gratitude or thanks to the gods or Yahweh? Mm-hmm. I I think there's I think there's several purposes. Um, I mean, and you see this in other ancient Near Eastern cultures. You have the same kind of thing where you'll get either ritual language and again some what we would think of as something liturgical okay you get r- like a ritual language some part of a of a ritual itself set to music or or written in such a way that it's it's more easy to remember it again it, you know it's just like poetry you know that it's a it's a memory device so i think that was that was one purpose for it you know, maybe even for the priests, you know, who had to perform, you know, these rituals. But because it's it's not it's not like everything was public to, to the masses all the time. I mean, there were some things that were, um, but you you can communicate you know, liturgy or ritual through them. You can communicate naturally if if the the content component is about the deity. That's like communicating points of theology as well. Um, so I, I think there there's a memory element. I don't think it was about making the the people listening feel a certain way. In other words, it wasn't directed to them; it was directed to the deity. 
But if, if you look at the content, it, it, there's still expressions of you know, the human condition in, in, in some respects. I mean, it, it really depends on context, you know, because you're going to have some things that are very, very cult oriented, you know, very specific reason why we're saying what we're saying. And then you're going to have other things that are more sort of freestyle, you know, adoration, again, not directed toward making us feel a certain way, but praising praising God, praising the deity in other, in other contexts. So I tend to think that, that what we do now, there, there are some significant disconnects, you know, in how, not only how we do worship, but how we even use some of those elements. Yeah, I actually think there's two parts to that question. Because um, when we talk about the Psalter and, and, and then why there's Levites always in, in front of the temple, always singing, mm-hmm. right, at the, at the doorway... Uh, I think those are two different questions, what, but the, le- the the priests always singing from the temple is really interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot. There's a, I think there's a lot we could say about that. But uh, one thing that I think is really interesting, and I think my, I don't know if we've talked I, about this. I think before. there's a sacred space element too. Because yeah. Normally, you don't see people singing all the time. Right. But when you when you encounter this place, it's like incense. Mm-hmm. It makes this place different. Singing, it makes this play. It, it marks out sacred space. But, but where else do you hear about choirs singing all the time? Yeah, yeah. in the Old Testament, in heaven. Yep. Yeah. But particularly in the heavenly temple. So th- this is really important, actually. Um, th- th- Job thirty-eight is an interesting passage here that that you can make a correlation to. Um, Job thirty-eight that is where God answers back Job. You know, really intense <laughs> passage, you know, not <laughs> really intense devotional right there. Um, you are nothing, you know, um, <laughs> I, I love it. But uh, they, they, they recount the, the, the narrative of creation and they tell it in, in a way, Job tells it in a way of temple building of temple construction. You know, when God's like, where were you when I laid the foundations, right? Or sank the plumb lines, but he's talking about creation. But he's creation is temple building, and so and what were the angels doing when they when it, when they created when they built? They were singing and rejoicing. So this is really interesting because you know I didn't pay it. To, it took me a while to catch on to this, and I think it was Margaret Barker or somebody. I can't remember who I read that that tipped me off on the connection, but but the idea that. There's singing going on and rejoicing as God's bringing order to the chaos, which is good news, right? Because there's inhabitable space. There's place with darkness and chaos. And when God begins constructing his temple and bringing order to that which has no order, it's something worthy to be praised and to sing about. And so when the temple's constructed, they're singing and rejoicing of the angels in heaven and the priests are like mirrors of that reality and not just mirrors of that reality, but literal participants in it Mm -hmm. because an ancient Israelite wouldn't know the difference between temple and the temple of heaven per se, because there's overlap there. We call it the gateway of, you know, heaven on earth kind of. Yeah. I remember when we were doing Mm -hmm. the series on Leviticus, you know, we talked about concepts of sacred space that, one of the reasons they had they had calendar and calendar was a big deal and festivals and and the timing of this or that was this notion of being in sync. That's know. it's also astral. Yeah. So all, all these things mark out sacred space. God's house is where you would expect order. Right. That's right. You won't you don't expect disorder there. You and what do you order. find? And what do you find in that Job thirty eight text? It's interesting. Who are the ones singing? It it says it's the sons of God, but it also calls them the stars. Right. Yeah. So it, it's the, the idea your, your that that order and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, the celestial order, everything is kept in order. Right. So when you see like a falling star, you know, it's normally some rebel angel or something in the Old Testament. So, yeah, it, that's yeah. actually exactly right. Actually, that's I think that's one of the best ways you could put it yeah, there, is you're in tune rever- with the heavenly theme. order. That's that's a really good way to put it, because that's the way ancients actually an inter- interesting note on that. This is one of the main reasons uh, Mike and I were just talking about this. This is one of the main reasons why the Qumran sectarians, not necessarily all the literature from Qumran, but the sectarian literature at Qumran 
And I'm thinking in particularly a letter called 4QMMT. And this was a letter uh, written to Jerusalem from the sectarians who were separating. And in this letter, you, what, you find a number of interesting things. But one of the main reasons they separate from Jerusalem cult um, was they were on an astral calendar, uh, on, a, on, on a lunar calendar, excuse me, and, and they were on the solar calendar. And they believed that... Now, for us, modern people, we'd think that's... Why would you yeah. fight and go who, out to the cares? wilderness over yeah. this? Who gives a rip? Well, yeah. yeah, what a stupid thing to separate over. But it's not stupid if you actually believe that those festivals that you're participating in are literally participating with the angels of heaven. And that your participation in the cultic festivals and in those times and seasons are literally assisting in those who would keep the orders of the whole cosmos. And so if you're doing the wrong thing, guess what? The cosmos is out of whack because you're supposed to participate with them. And so that was a huge deal in early Judaism. This was not a small thing. So this is, so the being in tune with, with the, the, the heavenly order is a really big deal in early Judaism. Got one over here. Are we going around? I just okay. wanted to tag on to Brian's question then, in light of everything you said, at the quantum level, everything is vibration. And so we talk about bringing order out of chaos, and the angels are singing, and the angels are the stars. So without spending a lot of time elaborating, do you think it matters then what tune we play or what harmony we put to it or what rhythm we use with it? Um, and, and I'm just thinking about how things have changed from the um, expressions of the psalms that would come out of people like Bach and Mozart versus the expression of the same psalms that's coming through a lot of more popular Christian music that draws its themes from secular music. Do you think that matters? Yeah, I don't. I don't I'm, a, I'm a music idiot. So, I, I mean, literally, I don't even know what the notes are. I don't know how I got out of grade school, you know without knowing this. I mean, it, I, I understand why you're asking, but it, music in ancient Israel would have been dramatically different than Bach and, and Mozart as well. So I don't, I don't know that we can make, make a, a value judgment on the music. I certainly can't because I don't know anything about it. But I think we can make a value judgment on sort of why we're doing what we're doing. Uh <sighs> And I realize this is subjective too, but one of the one of the points of application you get out of what David was saying, the whole you know, you're you're being sacred space should be different. You should, you're invited to sacred space. What goes on here should reflect, you know, what again uh, the idea of of you know orderliness and glorifying you know God that that went with sacred space, you know, cast in heaven. So those are the kinds of things we can we can use even though we're not so tuned into this idea of being in sync with the angels and all that sort of thing. But we can still take what, what they were thinking when they were doing that and ask ourselves, you know, are we, you know, pun intended, are we in tune with that? You know, that sort of thing. So to me, I th for me personally, again, because I don't know anything about, I can't really evaluate um, what's actually done in performance, but I think we, I can evaluate um, you know, do, does this does this draw not only the person doing it but the congregation? Does it feel like we're on sake on holy ground now? Does it feel like we've entered sacred space? Is this different than than what you know what our regular lives are? Again, trying to get to the distinctions, trying to think in these terms um, that this this should be something special. The, the problem you know, that we run into is that we are sacred space. So it's a little bit different. But I think even though when we gather as an assembly, it's still useful to be reminded of these ideas. It, it's still, this is still point, you know, points of biblical theology that are useful to help us maybe take our minds away from the mundane things of life and get us to focus on you know, the heavenly life that awaits us and so on and so forth. So I think it's very useful. Um, uh, can I add one, sure, one more thing? Ahead. Just one quick thing about that question. Uh, I was asked that question a lot, you know, as a pastor, and th there's two different answers I would give to it. One, there is, I think, a, uh, I hesitate to use this word, but um, there is an objective, eh, 
a kind of objective sense of harmony to the to the to the created order that that humans are intended to tap into and i think that's where most a lot of beauty comes from like a lot of art and music are are i i mean i have philosopher buddies who have done phd's on this i haven't but but about beauty as an objective apologetic and so uh, beautiful music should be, i mean the most beautiful music should be in the church and i actually agree with that um I think the most excellent music should always uh, should be in the church, I think. But the second part, the answer to that that's, I think, really important for people who ask the question is to know that we have to remember that when, when Revelation talks about a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are all worshiping uh, the Lamb, they're all doing it in their own languages, and God doesn't make them. It's really interesting that God doesn't make it all one language. You know, isn't that interesting? It's like it, because some some Jewish traditions at the time would say things like, and you find this in pseudepigraphal literature um, that that the the heavenly language is Hebrew, and that's that's what all the animals and the humans spoke yeah. before the fall. And this is actually a pretty dominant uh, Jewish view at the period of Jesus. Actually, weird folks but um since hebrew is like a post akkadian dialect but whatever um some of them thought that but it shows the ethnocentricity of it like you have to speak our language you have to be just like us but the new testament shows a completely different picture that the worship is actually different languages and different cultures and sometimes that's going to be different melodies different tunes just and that's beautiful to god so i think the multifacetedness of worship is actually essential in the world. I'm jotting myself a note here because it's too bad um, Stephen uh, Hubscher's not here. You know, he's he's posted several things on celestial worship. He is a mu- he is a musician, so I'm I'm just putting myself giving myself a note to ask him, you know, to maybe maybe give us a post on that. What he thinks about that. Hello, I'm Jonathan. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, um, so a few days ago, I was able to go hear N.T. Wright speak at the McFarland Memorial Auditorium in SNU. And it was the first lecture out of three, I think, about the Jesus we never knew. And in it, he brought up, up early on a lecture, he brought up a point about how we look at the afterlife right now versus how the first century disciples would have looked at it. And the theme of it was that to them, uh, you know, heaven and earth, they belong together. They were experiencing something that was like, you know, the climax of, of world history, you know, the resurrection of Christ. But then he mentioned that how we looked at the afterlife now is more borrowed from Gnosticism. It's a private spirituality. When you die, you go to heaven. It's escapist. Mm -hmm. And that if the first century disciples had really thought that way, they wouldn't have been persecuted because they were proclaiming, no, 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 it's a new world order right here, right now. You know, something, you're not going to worship Caesar anymore. Jesus is the king now. And that's why they were even persecuted. It wasn't kind of like, oh, we'll do what you want. And then, you know, when you die, you get to see what the kingdom looks like. And then I kind of feel like this sort of, that tells into everything we're saying because I believe that when you look at the Old Testament, you see that an N.T. Wright brought this up, that the tabernacle is a model of creation, that all these things, you know, mirror what's going on above. And they're supposed to be constant reminders that one day when things are perfectly set up, heaven and earth will be one thing. They'll, yeah, be, they'll, they'll be married. They'll be reunited. My disturbing thought of that is, you know, being a non-specialist, I always, you know, the Gnostic view, I thought, oh, my, so we inherited this Gnostic view. And that's what I've always yeah. heard. Am I wrong to think that way then, you know? Well, he, in his book, he refers to it as Platonic, um, Platonic eschatology. Yeah, I, I kind of disagree with him too. But, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't deny, um, what, when he says stuff like that, some have wondered or, and accused him of denying an intermediate state. In other words, you die, you're with the Lord. Okay, so that, like like you do go somewhere and but 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 he'll say that that Paul affirms an intermediate state, you know, some kind of thing like that. But I I so I since he does that, since he doesn't deny that, he would be to use his own words back at him. Well, you're a little platonic too then. Um but I think what his polemic is, he do, he doesn't want to. Let me say it this way: I think he thinks there's an overemphasis on that, and not enough emphasis on seeing 
the purpose of the atonement, you know, your, your, your destiny as a believer, projecting it, you know, sort of, okay, when I die, then I'm out of here. And, and, and for a lot of believers, that's sort of where it ends. That, that's the end game. And what he's saying is we, we shouldn't be overemphasizing that, but again, not denying it. We should be thinking more in terms of, and this will be familiar for this audience, restoring Eden. And we actually got into this today because I, I said, you know, this is how, you know, we, we talk about it on the show. This is, you know, how I talk about it in the book. And, and I mean, he, he's right there. So that, I think for him, it, it's an issue of emphasis. Um, you want to add anything to that? With with all due respect to Dr. Wright, um, I cut my teeth on his work in my undergrad. This is not the only place and, where David disagrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is not the only place I disagree with him. But um, me, me and him had this debate in 2014 when I when I defended my paper against him, um, uh, and we're hopefully we'll have it again Monday. Um, uh, but um, this this notion that. And now a lot of a lot of things he says around this topic I completely agree with, but this this picking and you will hear this a lot if you pay attention, is he the 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 modern critique is uh, of like everyone who's writing who like bought into that paradigm, they'll say, um, well you either believe in a physical you know this earthly resurrection or you're a Platonist, that's actually not true in the mm-hmm. ancient world. And that's an oversimplification because there are other ways of thinking about uh, becoming. So, so this is his objection to other scholars uh, like myself who think that the celestial transformation is literal for Paul, that they he literally believes you'll become like the celestial bodies. Now, for Wright, what he thinks is, well, then you're just a Platonist because the the celestial bodies in Plato, they're uh, they're asomaton, they're unbodied. Their, your, your soul or your psychon is, it leaves the body, the prison, Plato calls it, you know, and you flee the prison and then you're f- truly free in heaven. That's only a Platonist view. The Stoics in the ancient world do not agree. Take Cicero, for example. Cicero, and I'm, this is a major part of my research, actually. Cicero ch- chides Plato for this. And even so, Cicero's writing in Latin, and he writes this text called "On the Nature of the Gods," mm-hmm. and it's it's probably the most definitive treatment. And you, there's English translations of this you can read online for free. So, um, because it's you know open source or whatever you call it. Um, uh, so Cicero talks about how the Platonists say that the gods are, and even quotes Plato in Greek, even though he's writing in Latin, saying. The Platonists who say that the gods are unbodied, he says, is wrong because any anything that has movement and will and operation is a bodied phenomena. So they have bodies. They're not the same kinds of bodies as like humans. They're immortal. They're made of like pneuma or ether, which is what exactly actually the words Paul uses when he's describing the resurrection body. He uses the same language. He says that we put off the psychicon or the, or the epigea, the terrestrial, the earthy bodies, and we put on the pneumatic bodies, the celestial bodies. And so the stuff of heaven, of the heavenly bodies, is the stuff that our resurrection bodies are made out of. So you can have a celestial body and it be bodied and be perfectly okay in the Greek world. So it's not this one or the other. You know, there's a plethora of views. My gosh, Cicero has like, <laughs> I mean, there's like so many different Greek uh, philosophers that all disagree on this. Yeah, right. So it's not that simple. Wright will tend to get criticized by other people for. I don't. I don't, I don't know that there'd be anybody to put it in these terms because it sounds pejorative, but but kind of either or fallacies. Uh, some will accuse him of being very reductionistic in an argument, and you know, he, yeah, he does some of that. I, I've actually. I know wondered. a couple who say that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, they'll, they'll, they'll use that. <laughs> I'm, they'll, they'll, they'll go unnamed, right? I, I, I've kind of wondered if he's not a little too, if he hasn't bought a little too much of, of the common view for the Old Testament, that the Old Testament doesn't really have the concept of an afterlife, you know, it, which I, I don't believe either, but, but that's sort of a dominant view. So it, he might be thinking. In other words, it, it, if you think that it cuts off continuity with the, the the sort of real embodied 
uh, existence, you know, with the Lord, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. So if you don't believe that, it, it, it looks like what Paul's doing is, again, pardon the pun, out of the ether. You know, like he, he's not getting it from anywhere. Yeah. There's no continuity in the Old Testament. So I think, I I just think get you that hit the impression. nail on the head. I just get that impression. I think Mike just hit the nail on the head is the sources for this stuff, right? What you'll see in scholarship, and a, a lot of a lot of folks just don't know this because they're they don't have time to read all this junk, you know. But it's in scholarship. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. Yeah, it's just God. It's so technical and takes forever. It's annoying. But um, but the some of the some of the sources of this resurrection body stuff is not just Hellenistic. That some scholars will say this is a Hellenistic development. You don't have any sort of afterlife stuff until you get the Hellenistic world till. After Alexander, the scriptures are translated into Greek and they're starting to mesh with kind of Hellenistic concepts of afterlife. That's just not true. That's just not true. It's demonstrably not true. And what Mike has said before, and I want to say amen times a thousand, is that if, if a lot of these New Testament scholars, now I don't fault them. And, and like I said before on the podcast, yet look, there's just so much literature out there. It's impossible to master even your field. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of the New Testament scholars don't have any sort of, or at least not long enough, formal training in ancient Near Eastern context. So they're doing Hellenistic world stuff, and m- many of them haven't spent time in the ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. But if you if you know if you know, uh, I had to do this in my thesis that Mike was a reader on was uh, that astral deification existed for the pharaohs in Egypt hundreds of years before you even have a Hebrew Bible. Like the, the, the pharaohs are said to not only become a star or ascend above the stars, sometimes to join their brothers or to reign over the stars. Even uh, interesting pyramid text I found uh, uh, pre, just pre the Middle Kingdom where the pharaoh, upon his death, not only ascends to heaven to join the stars, but he rules over them and the skies turn to black. There's an earthquake when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Where have you heard that before? <laughs> you know, so these uh, we're talking we're talking like a thousand years before Jesus almost, you know. So I'm just saying this stuff exists in the ancient Near East. Don't if someone tells you that this stuff is new and Hellenistic, don't buy it for a second. Just don't buy it because this stuff is all over the ancient Near Eastern world. That's my little shtick. Sorry. That's one of David's hobby horses. Yeah. yeah. Where, where's uh, who's next? Yeah. Questions? Go ahead and pass it. I'm just curious. Um, when you talked about the sink with the festivals, um, does that have anything to say today? You know, I know it was for the nation of Israel, and they were, you know, the purpose of taking the good news to the rest of the world. Um, that would be my question. Does it have any are, relevance for today? Are you, you wondering know? in in terms of liturgy? Or are you talking about chronology and calendar? Yeah, I think both. You okay. know, because it seems like there is such a disorder in in worship today. You know, mm-hmm. what do we do? And and so some people have gone back to that. You know, yeah. And and I see why. You know, because it seems to make sense. You know, when you read that, it seems to be something that sets it apart and i'm just wondering if there's yeah i think some people definitely go too far but I'm, yeah i you know cr- christian liturgy again because of the whole new testament idea that we are the temple christian liturgy tended to instead of focusing on i'll say it this way instead of focusing directly on a, a sync idea because I, I don't think they entirely lost that but a lot of the liturgy w- was sort of focused on and I, I don't want to sound too Catholic, but um, re, okay. reenacting or reminding people of the significant event of the cross and certain theological points that went with that. But, I mean, early Christian calendar, yeah. okay, you still have this sense that it's really important that we know the right day for Easter. Okay, that, that whole you know controversy... Uh, in the early church, all the way up through the Middle Ages, like mm-hmm. like this is crucial because of this thinking. Again, so that there there's still some of that, even though you know the the, the temple, as it were, is now us. Okay, but I, I think 
I think we have to keep in mind, you know, is there any relevance to this? If, if my astronomer friend was here, he would say, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> but think, yes. th there, there's also this sense of while we are the church, there is, to, to use, to borrow David's language here, while we are the church, there is still something being built. In other words, the heavenly temple is being built, being constructed, uh, moving ahead in time, you know, that, that, that it's, it's ongoing it's a process, you know, everything is moving to where God wants it to go because ultimately the abode of God will return to earth. So you, you, you kind of have the individual temple merging with the bigger idea you know, in the eschaton. And so that's why even in, in, in Christian, you know, early Christian history, the, the Easter one is sort of the most obvious one that, that gets connected to the yes. celestial stuff. But it, it's why there was still a lot of speculation on um, like timing of the second coming, okay? Because it results in the heaven returning to earth and, and, the, and the joining of all this stuff. So it never it never quite loses that. Maybe in practical terms, if we just talked about that in church, yeah. Instead of sort of making up ceremonies, you know, you know if, if we just talked about that in church, people would would be thinking about it more in, in terms of well, why are we here? Why are we gathered? What what in the world are we doing here? You know? Yeah. To, to piggyback off that, um, I don't mind sounding Catholic. I have no problem uh, <laughs> uh, sounding Catholic. Um, I you sounded think, East, Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, yesterday. Orthodox. <laughs> yeah, my roommate's Orthodox. I have a lot of so I have a lot of good Orthodox and Catholic buddies, and I'm extremely ecumenical. Like I do not think that uh, the church started in the 16th century. So that's just stupid. Um, but uh, <laughs> that. But look, there are a lot of babies thrown out with the bathwater after the Reformation. Okay, a lot of babies, and we're pro life, so we don't like that. So, um, the temp the the temple liturgy, the, there's a a weird book, but I think a lot of the stuff in it is good. I was thinking Margaret Barker's. Uh, mm -hmm. I the, thought you were going to do a Tom Horn book. Uh, no. Uh, the, <laughs> get out of here. Uh, the 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 temple the. The Temple Roots for Early Christian Liturgy. I think it's what it's called. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I, that's the title. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, but the point, her point, her overall point, she has some weird stuff in there, but some really awesome stuff. Uh, but her overall point, I completely agree with, which is that, uh, and, and Mike alluded to this, is that Temple Liturgy didn't go away in early Christianity. And this whole notion that, a lot of product, free church Protestants have, and I'm not knocking one. I, I was one, am one. I don't know. But, but um, that, you know, who want to go back to house church and that's a real church, man. That's an early church. Well, that's because you're being persecuted, okay? Like that's because you're kicked out of the synagogues. As soon as Christians could build buildings, they did. So this, you know, it's not – don't take everything as prescriptive that you see – in, in, with this whole New Testament church movement, because that that isn't even a thing. Like, what New Testament church? They're different in different cities. You know, some may be still close to the synagogue. Some were kicked out. Some were just started in houses. Some were mainly Gentile. Some were only Jewish. So yeah, let's stop that stuff. But what we do know for sure is when those buildings were built, the very buildings themselves, you still see this in Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, Episcopal churches, the, the actual shape of the sanctuary itself is modeled after the temple. You have the holy place and the most holy place, which is the altar is there where the actual body and blood of the Lord is. And they, they thought that the, the actual liturgy in the early church, they, they, this is what they thought, like Mike was alluding to, they are participating in, in uh, the order of the cosmos. They, they really believe that stuff. And the liturgy was essential. This is not something like where you have Christian discipleship like on, during the week and then you go to church. That wasn't a thing in the ancient world. You go to liturgy and like then you really become a Christian. Like, so that's, that's how a lot of the early church saw it. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying, oh, you go be Orthodox or Catholic. I'm not saying that. Don't hear that. Uh, but, but I do believe that that is what early Christians believed. And that's why the liturgy was patterned, uh, I mean, almost, almost the entire thing <laughs> off of temple-like traditions. And so, uh, yeah, I just think that's really important. And a lot of Protestants just either don't even know that or or don't realize the significance of that. 
So think twice if you're listening to this via podcast before you make fun of your Catholic buddies, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, also want to apologize to Tim Andrews at the house church. That's a, <laughs> that's a shot across the bow from Tim. Yeah, I think I think again, the house church thing, you know, really has to be contextualized. Um, no, uh, and, and Tim will forgive you too. So yeah. sorry, Tim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, Tim would appreciate we're at a coffee shop and how much yeah, he loves coffee. Yeah, I mean, for him, it's like. You know, you get a, I don't know if you remember the episode with Tim uh, on the podcast, but there's just a lot of, there's a lot of personal dynamic there with, I'll I'll put it this way, the the whole, the whole modern house church thing really isn't a protest against, you know, like liturgy or anything like that, but it's, again, this is just my experience, I just try to make a good general point here it's really composed of a lot of people who are tired of playing church in, in, in a modern context. And those people tend to sort of get together. And once they get together and they start to, okay, we got two or three or four families here who kind of feel the same way. Well, the strategy for them isn't to go back to this thing that either where they're not getting taught or there's, there's some kind of dynamic going on there that, you know, legitimately has led to them being really discouraged, you know, in, in terms of, of the whole worship, not just worship, but what the community is supposed to be doing. And so that's where, where are you going to turn? You, you could, it's, it's full of people who, are, who just see something that needs to be done and they're just going to do it. And they know it's imperfect. They're not saying every every Christian in the, in the world ought to do this. And, you know, they're, they're not doing that. It, um, so it's not a, it's not a movement in that sense. I, I, if you look at it that way, it's more of a, of a reaction that's happening in a lot of places because, okay, what else do we do here? We don't want to just quit. Yeah. And let me just clarify. I really did not mean to disparage any sort of house church thing. Please don't hear what I'm Tim, saying that way. Tim will forgive you. Yeah. And it, first of all, just to be in context, if anyone gives their life to Christ, period, that's the greatest miracle on earth. There's nothing greater than that. So if they're a house church and that happens, that's cool. They're my brother and sister. Don't care. I'm going to pass it over here. The question I have is in reference to, um, I guess, the New Testament church, what we call the assembly, in contrast or mirror to the heavenly order. And we kind of touched upon it earlier your question, um, first part of 1 Corinthians 11, we see, we see it as the, you know, look at it as the head covering issue, but I think that there's actually a bigger picture there that we're seeing the heavenly order and administration mirrored in the assembly and the synchrony between heaven and the order in heaven and the order on earth in the assembly. And from that, too, do we also see a picture of uh, going back to the Old Testament, 1 Kings 22, seeing Micaiah there in the, you know, the heavenly council determining the judgment against Ahab, and that there is a, um, a declaration that comes out of that assembly as to what is to happen, and it's the declaration of the Most High. When we get to John chapter 20, we see that um, the Lord instructed the disciples that they had the power to forgive sins and to retain sins, again, as an aspect of the assembly in, in, in judgment of the church in order, maintaining the glory of the Lord and the testimony of the Lord in the earth. And so I guess the question in the statement this is, do we see... Do you see that aspect of the um, unseen realm mirrored in the uh, in the New Testament assembly? I'm going to start off with a, a general comment here. I think there's I think there is something to that because I sort of view I, I didn't really get into this in unseen realm too much, but I sort of see what church is supposed to be as a community and as a family. 
And of course, family includes these things. It includes rebuke. It includes accountability. It includes encouragement. You know, to to live a holy life. You know, the way you should. And um, I see what what should go on in church as far as the believing community as kind of council training on earth, if I can if I can say it that way, because we are you know our ultimate destiny is to be rejoined to this thing. You know the the kingdom of God, the rulership of God, the family of God, and and we already are, but we're not yet. You know that sort of thing. So I, just generally, it would be. Again, I, I'm I'm not saying that we should do, sort of, you know, bizarre in, invent bizarre ritualistic things, to, kind of align with our imagination for these elements. I just wish that we would talk about these things in church. So people would would be more conscious of, well, this is what we are. This is what we're supposed to be. This is what we're gonna be. You know, to, to create you know a little bit of continuity between the present, between the already and the not yet. You know, to just be conscious that we're on this this trajectory. This thing that that we're doing now has a relationship to what went on before, not just in terms of the Israelite community, but in the wider family of God. You're going all the way back to Eden. And and that's where it's going to wind up. I don't know if you want to say anything more specific um, there. But. Well, he did ask the the question, the specific question about the the women, the head coverings, the angels thing, the order of creation. Well, Do I, you I, see that? I, I thought I thought yeah, you passage. were saying it's bigger than that. Or, it is bigger than that. Yeah. Did yeah. you li- did you hear his episode on the on the head coverings? No, I did because the it, the audio drops out after eleven minutes and there's nothing after that. Oh, oh really? Really? On YouTube? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go to oh. our website or go to yeah. iTunes, go to the podcast so anywhere yeah. other than YouTube. Oh, do we even want to get into this? <laughs> I don't know. No, I would refer back to the episode, <laughs> but can I will say something about that? Um, that is a really highly contested passage. I mean, the best scholars in the world still argue about that passage all the time. And I don't, I haven't made my mind up on it. Uh, I, I know Mike's convinced of that argument, yeah. but I've had some close friends that, that really, really disagree with that argument a lot. Uh, so I think it makes sense of, of the evidence. Uh, um, but at the same time, uh, I'm an I'm an egalitarian. I'm, my cards are on the table. Um, uh, you know, I think the Galatians three that neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, is the ideal of the celestial community. Like that's the ideal, but it's the in the already there are certain sociological phenomena where you just can't. You don't want to just tear up society and change it, you know, and say, oh, you are wrong, you jerks, you know. Um, so that's part of the being a humble servant is, you know, be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good slave. Yes, a slave. Be a good slave. Be a good this. The, but the 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 notches in the rock are already being chipped away of the edifice of this world. So like, but when they gather in community, and not everyone agrees with me on this, but but I think early on in the New Testament, what we see is this kind of image of a of an egalitarian worldview, not necessarily egalitarianism. And if you don't know what I mean by egalitarian, I just mean that uh, male and female roles are equal uh, in the earliest church. Um, uh, it means more than that, but uh, but like a universal equality in in the people of God. Um, but that includes roles, but that goes away really quickly because I think of the delay of the parousia, the delay of the coming of Christ, because when you have this apocalyptic fervor and everything is imminent and like resurrection is going to happen right now, the day is nigh, you know, uh, and that starts to die off. It's like, okay, we're going to need to tether this thing down. Uh, we're going to need a, the bishops to be a man of one wife and all that kind of stuff. So I think that, uh, this is just my view uh, that yes, there is some er- uh, heavenly and earthly order going on in those texts, but I think the the ideal of becoming like the angels in resurrection that Jesus and Paul talk about is one that's not given in marriage. You know, Jesus will say like like being that like the angels of heaven. He does not say the fallen ones. He says 
being like the angels of heaven who are not given in marriage, right? Um, th- that's kind of the celestial ideal that there, there won't be any need for procreation in that glorified sense. And I still can't wrap my mind around what the heck that means. You know, I've tried for years, uh, but, but I think there is some sort of embedded sort of egalitarian sense about the vision of the kingdom. So in cultures, and I, now you can push back on this, Mike, if you disagree, I, but I think, I think it, I think it can work in either model. I think in cultures yeah. though, that have, don't have the restraints that like the Greco Roman world had mm-hmm. and the ancient Jewish world had, the, the, some of those, re, some of those freedoms can be experienced in the mm-hmm. church. Now th- that's just my personal view on that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm open to being persuaded otherwise, but, but it seems to me that if Paul could have a lot of the freedoms that he wanted, he would have done them. Uh, but it's, it's one of those, you know, you care for the weaker brother, you take, you know, you, you don't try to mess up society, you know, you try to be, uh, you try to honor, you know, your love, your neighbors. Well, you know, you don't just go around pointing fingers in their faces, telling them they're wrong. You know, that's, that's called being a jerk and not loving them. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's take the heavenly council. Okay. You have, uh, I, I think, it, I think it can work in either model, the egalitarian model or a complementarian model, which again, if you don't know what that term means, it's, it's the male leadership kind of thing. Um, I think you could actually, again, construct an understanding of the relationship in either, in either respect example. Okay, in the council, you have all Elohim, again, defined as spiritual beings. But there still is hierarchy. There still is order. There still is role and rank and all this stuff. But on another level, they are all equal. So there's, there's ontological equality, and then there's this hierarchical relationships. And that's how the council runs. And so you can easily transpose that you know, to an unearthly order. You, know, you, you could look at it and say this well in the in the beginning in the edenic beginning you know both male and female were given the command okay this this is right this is your this is your role now you know within god's intended uh family relationship where you know you are supposed to be part of this in other words the commands are given equal and you could you could sort of riff off that to talk about an egalitarian model, and it goes back and forth all the time. Somebody else will bring up, well, you know, Adam named the animals in an ancient Near Eastern culture that denoted authority, and Eve doesn't do any naming, and you know, it, it just goes back and forth all the time. There are elements of both, you know, in the descriptions that you get. But uh, just one little thing mm-hmm. there. But Genesis three, it's not until Genesis three. Mind you, in the curse formula, in the curse formula of Genesis 3, it's the man lording over the woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, d- so, d- depending on how 316, yeah. Right. Which so, is re- a real controversial I, verse. No, so, just, just throwing the, that out there. The know? whole egalitarian, complementarian thing is just, I, I remember the first, first one of these annual meetings I ever went to was in 1994, and they were debating it then. Okay, I mean, it, it just never goes away. Yeah. And if if you if you're a long time reader of the blog, uh, I did a series on this, and I I invited John Hobbins, who's a pastor, and his wife's also a pastor, so he's egalitarian. And the invitation was make me care about this, because I, <laughs> I no, that, that was that was his mission. I said make me care, because I don't really care, you know, r- really ab- about the model. I, I care more about the abuses in either direction. Um, so. I, I mean, I, I can argue both sides of this until it, your, your mind just becomes dumb. You, know, you, you get into, well, did did Junia, did it have a circumflex over the alpha, you know, in the original text? Because that distinguishes the, ge- like, really? You know, we're, now, now we're down to determining doctrine based on the presence of a circumflex, which they didn't use, a little diacritical mark over a letter. They didn't use it in the earliest manuscripts and unsealed script, but that's where we're at now. It, so, is, inter- it is interesting, like, though. Care. And, and at the end of it, I, I told him he failed. I still don't care. 
I'm I hate being this guy, but on the Junia thing, okay. it is interesting that no, no, and I'm not doing the unseal thing. I don't care about that. <laughs> that it's but it but what is interesting is in medieval manuscripts, you actually have scribes change it to a male name, Junius. Yeah, because they're not down you, with having a female got, apostle. You got all of that stuff. They happened. actually change it. Yeah. Some of the medieval manuscripts. So that's pretty significant. Uh, they're like, eh, we don't want Paul to say that. You, you know, know I, I think that I think that the more interesting question, and, and you can sort of backtrack it from this, is to ask, will there be gender roles in the new heaven and the new earth? Okay, there, there's certainly hierarchy because, you know, we inherit the nations it's and all that gendered. kind of stuff. Right, but it's not gendered, you know, specifically. So... If, if you want to approach it from sort of where it ends and then walk it back, that's going to determine, again, how you look at it, too. It, it, it's, just, it's just one of these things that, that can be endlessly articulated and debated from both sides. And I'm like, look, I'm more interested in how the people, you know, me, you know men and women within your community, yeah. how they're relating to each other as imagers. I don't care what role they have. You know, necessarily. Yeah. Just how how are we doing this? How are um, we a family? Yes, 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 yes. I want to be very clear. Just because I said I was egalitarian, these are not issues to divide over. Okay? Some of my best friends in the world are hardcore, like, raging complementarians. Like, woman get in the kitchen complementarians. Now, I'm not, I, I'm making fun of them. But, but seriously, these, these are not issues to divide over. Um the unity in Christ is way more important than this. Yeah, uh, I, I, and you know, I'm a big believer in God understands that we're not omniscient. So why should we like have to become omniscient to think we're, we're pleasing God? You know, I think God has a very realistic view of who we are and 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 how we're able to figure things out. Could you maybe tie in the calling? Even like, what is God, God called you to and attaining to that? Yeah, I. I I think you could, and ultimately, that's going to be between the per the individual and God. Um, you know, like I agree one with of, that. One of the things that 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 you know, um, Hobbins. I don't know if he asked it in one of the posts or if it was a conversation or something. Okay, well, uh, and, and I actually got this in some job interviews too. What if one of your students or like your your daughter or something says, "You know, I feel the Lord's called me into ministry." What are you going to say? And my answer was, "Do a good job." You know, I said, you, now, you got to be, got to know the lay of the land here. Some people are going to look at this and hear the reasons why they're, they're going to look negatively at it. Others are going to look positively. You need to know what you're getting into. Um, Good thing I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I can, and I, and I would look at my daughter and say, you know, I can argue this both ways and I'll, I'll go through the whole thing with you. But at the end of the day, if you know, if you sincerely you know, feel that the Lord wants you to do X, Y, or Z, then you need to obey. And if it's the wrong decision, we have to believe that God will alert you to that. He will do something to change your mind. He will steer you in a different. But for right now, if, if you're being you know honest with God, this is what you do. You know, you you obey. You know, so your conscience is clear, and so and and so my role would be supporting her to do that, to be obedient as best as she. You know, knows you know what to do or how to do it. You know, if we get to heaven and and God comes to me and says, "Yeah, Burnett was right. You, we should have all been egalitarians." It's like I'm say, I'm, I'm not going to say, "Oh, well, I don't want to be here anymore." For the record, I mean, this just this just ruins it for me. <laughs> for the record, I did not say we all have to be that. It's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. So, yeah. I would like to go back to something that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Burnett. Uh, basically. That in the first century there was this fervency about men, the resurrection is imminent. And then as time went on, kind of, you know, the posture changed, right? Yeah. And I want to touch on this book by Agarius Willis, What Paul Meant. And he sort of said that Paul's main drive for everything he did was that he saw the risen Christ. That was his kind of, that's what drove him every day. And you can see that from when you read his epistles and so on. Okay, so sorry. as time went on, you know, when you go to church every week, you hear about the atonement. You don't really hear about the resurrection unless it's Easter. 
it, right? So my, <laughs> my question is, why did that happen? And how, how does that then deal? Not that it's an overemphasis, because for all I know, it's probably, you know, God's providence, you know, because you knew it would take a while for him to get back here. But how does that then sort of disconnect us from the bigger picture of heaven and earth being together and what the end goal is? What a fabulous question. Um, so, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> all right. So to, to address the uh, preaching on the atonement, not the <laughs> resurrection, there is no atonement without the resurrection. Period. Period. Now, let's, let's be very clear about something. And uh, people will read over this text and not pay attention to the gravity of it. But if you look at the end of Romans 4, this is especially for my Reformed buddies, okay? The, the end of Romans 4, Paul makes something very clear about what the resurrection does. He says that Christ died for our tra- transgressions or for our sins, but he was raised for our justification, which, which could be translated vindication or even deliverance. Um, because it's, it's, you're being justiced, you know, justice is being done. Um, and so there is no justification without the resurrection. Period. So if you ever preach the cross, you pastors who are listening to this, listen up. If you ever preach the cross without the resurrection, shame on you. Because let me tell you something. If, if the cross is what solves the problem, and this is, again, I, I have a lot of, I have huge problem with preachers and theologians that put too much emphasis on atonement on the cross. I'm not saying the cross doesn't take care of atonement, okay? Just hear what I'm saying. Is that if you preach just the cross for atonement, what you get is you get the road to Emmaus story put right in your face. And what happened when you have a dead Jesus and no resurrection? What happens? People go away saying it's over. It's over. It was all BS. We can all go home. This is garbage. It's it, nothing happened. But with the resurrection, that is the vindication. That is the validation. That is the justification. And man, oof, I, I mean, you cannot have atonement without the justification. So there's that. Okay, now that that's off my chest, um, the, 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 uh, the problem with the delay of the Prusia, I think personally, this is a very big problem. Um, there's a recent, uh, actually, there's a, actually a really interesting book that just came out by, um, Christopher Hayes. It's yeah, edited I, by Christopher Hayes. I posted something on you it. You did post on it? Well, yeah, that, that it was available. Okay. Yeah. The gist like, of it. Yeah. What's it? Uh, when, when the son of man didn't come. Something like that. I think is what it's called. Yeah. I think it's when the Son of Man didn't come, I think it's called. But it's dealing with this problem. And it's a whole collection of Christian theologians, biblical scholars, d- dealing with this problem. Because it is a huge problem in early Christianity. And it, and it, and it caused a lot of uh, ethical and ecclesial issues. Because if when, when you're in radical Jewish apocalypticism and... Mike's talked about this, and I've talked about this before, but resurrection is an eschatological thing. That is an end-of-time thing in Judaism. There isn't some sort of resurrection and then other stuff later. It's like resurrection is, that's it. I mean, the covenant's been fulfilled. They're glorified. They live forever. That's it. So when you have Jesus raised in the middle of history and the great resurrection doesn't take place, you have a problem, right? So... Uh, that that the early Jewish believers and Gentile believers who knew the promises of Israel being taught to them, uh, either through catechesis or just teaching through Scripture or whatever, um, th- 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 this was a big issue, and I think it still is a big issue for historians uh, dealing with the problem. That's why I think these books are really important to to address. Um, I'm not sure if I agree with the the answer that that book gives, but it's a really helpful book nonetheless. But in terms of you mentioned something about how, you know, resurrection affects like, you know, what we do in church now. And, and I would say yes and amen that every act that we do in the world that brings life to the world testifies to the truth of the resurrection. So some people will say and you'll hear this quite often, actually. I've heard this from my pagan uh, anthropologist friends who have like PhDs from UT um, say like. 
well, why would you persist and continue uh, in Christian ministry when, when there is no, when, when, if you can't show them any sort of tangible hope, right? So like say working, trying to set up an orphanage or something in, in a, in a low income community to try to deal with the, the problem of unwanted children and, and, uh, the government shuts it down. You know, is that a failure? Like did, did the wor- work of God fail in that community? But if you believe in the resurrection and this is critical, this is so important. In 1 Corinthians 15, all that t- highfalutin theology about resurrection ends with one of the most important statements in the entire New Testament. And he says, therefore, because of all that stuff I just said, the work you do now is not in vain. Because that's, if we, again, if, we th- if we're thinking of resurrection as vindication, then everything you do, no matter on the world's scope, it might fail, quote unquote. And when we're getting our hands bloodied and sweaty for working for Jesus in the world and the world might say, ha ha, look at those failed projects. Well, on the resurrection, buddy, those are not going to be failed. I mean, on the resurrection, all of that work will be vindicated. And, and, and the resurrection is literally the core of all Christian work in the world. All Christian service in the world is centered on the resurrection because we really believe that that God is literally breathing new life into the world. I mean, we really believe that spirit that brought a man up from the dust has brought a man up from the dust again. We believe that. Like, we believe that new creation has already begun. And we're either down with that project and we're involved with it, or we're not. And the the hinge, uh, whether we are or not, is how much do you really believe in the resurrection? Because the problem of Christian ethics, I would say is anchored in the problem of the resurrection. Why you don't have good Christian ethics in liberal Christianity is because they don't believe in the resurrection. This is the, this is the reason. If, 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 if you have a 100% assured faith in that God vindicated Jesus and literally raised him from the dead, then guess what? You can do anything. You can do anything. There is nothing that can separate you from the power of God in Christ because he's demonstrated it by raising him from the dead. I'm preaching now. I'm sorry, but that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a big deal. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm a preacher too, okay? I'm not just, uh, well, you know. You're not letting him have any more coffee? Yeah, push, <laughs> push the coffee away from him. Anybody? Uh, this one's uh, for you, Mike. Sure. Um, it's a hermeneutic question. I obviously, I believe in the, your Deuteronomy 32 worldview because it has explanatory power with phenomenon re-experience. Mm-hmm. But what is the method for interpreting the scripture? Because obviously you don't take their cosmology about the flat earth, the dome. You don't bring that over. Mm-hmm. You leave that, take the theological message over into our realm. How do you make that distinction? How do, what's the process you go through? to make those decisions that, okay, this is real, we can take this over here, mm-hmm. or this is just God using their beliefs to tell them something. Yeah, for, for me, it's, it's about general revelation and, you know, special revelation. And it's relationship to, you know, our own experience as embodied beings. What I mean by that is you have biblical writers that God chose who lived at a certain time and place and have certain access to understanding the natural world and, and all this, all these limitations. And God is, is completely aware of that. And he allows them to express spiritual ideas, okay, spiritual you know, points of, of theology. Uh, he, he allows them to express these things using the tools of, or, or the illustrations or or the analogies, or, or even more than that, you know, handling general revelation in a specific way as part of this communication. Okay. So, again, God knows what they're doing. He picked them to do the job. He knows what the ultimate reality is and what it isn't. He has a perfect command of, of creation and whatnot. Nevertheless, he lets them do this. He lets them communicate the way they do it. Yeah, I mean, from his, their limited his knowledge. message, but he never says to them, hey, no, the world really isn't like that. Right. It's actually like and, this. And what, and what I take you know? from that is God could care less about what they knew. Yeah. So but with we, that we, same, can, go ahead. we can look at that, and because we live in the embodied world, 
and, and the, the knowledge of science grows, our knowledge of the natural world grows, if God were doing the same thing today, asking one of us to produce this passage, we would use completely different language and analogies and, and we, would, we would think about that and express that point in a completely different way. And we might mess it up in terms of science. Because if God did it a thousand years from now, then our, our touch points with this, again, the embodied world and, and how we think about it and how we either think it relates to the spiritual world or how we use it to express what, you know, something going on in the spiritual, spiritual world, that's going to change. It can be tested with the tools of science because it's part of the embodied world. All that's different than claims and assertions you know, made in Scripture about the disembodied world, the non-human world. We are dependent on, on God's trustworthiness as he prompts people to, make, you know, to express these ideas in certain ways, even though the vehicle to express those things might be something that we can test it today and say, well, that, that's, you know, that, that's not really the case here. But that doesn't lose the, that's not the same as the assertion. The vehicle for expressing the assertion isn't the assertion. They're two related but different things. And if it's not subject to the tools and analysis of the natural world, because by definition it isn't, because it's not part of the natural world, then we can't use the thing that we can test through the tools of science to test the things that science cannot deal with that are outside the natural world. Okay, so so you, that, you draw that, the line at... That's the way I, I parse it. Whatever's know, on that myself. side of the world, that side of the line of right, reality we, we can't, is what he's trying to tell us. Right. I, I, think, I think the obvious point is we can't use the tools of science to test something that isn't material. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I mean like, say for example... It would be absurd. Yeah, well, like, hypothetically, the whole divine council worldview, maybe they had that. God used that to express theology. Right. Now, how do we know that we can take that along with the theology as being? I think in that in that case, the the uniqueness or the phenomenon of the election of Israel. In other words, Israel is made different, not not because of any quality of it, but because God wanted a relationship with this people, and by definition, then what's going on with the other people, you know, the, the yeah. people surrounding that? Well, they're if they're not in covenant relationship with with Yahweh, okay, with with the you know, the most high, you know, whatever term we want to use here, then by definition they're they're outside that covenant relationship. And so that that lends a coherence to the idea of, well, they do worship other gods, so where'd they come from? You can't have um, and you could reduce this to sort of philosophical discussion here. Can you have more than one most high? Can you have more than one uncreated being? You know, all these things that are required of Yahweh. And so, you know, philosophers and theologians, I, I think, are the work they do, the thinking they do, the way they they uh, try to probe the propositions for coherence. I think they're they're useful at this point. Um, so, you you can say certain things about the entities in the spiritual world, the relationship of those entities that transcends, you know, something inscripturated. I mean, you, again, you you can probe it in different ways. But it, that's different than trying to use the tools of science to do that. Yeah. You have to use the tools of something else. I mean, it does do have that. explanatory power in our yeah. realm. I mean, you can. So I just don't like going backwards. Like, oh, this explains this, therefore that's real. Now I can go back to the scripture. And <laughs> I don't know what you mean by going backwards. Well, we we take the divine council worldview, bring it into our mm -hmm. realm, and explain some things. Uh, right. You know about well. Let, let's wipe Deuteronomy things. thirty-two off the table, or anything. Take anything okay. that way. Okay, God has entered into a covenant relationship with one people. Yeah. Therefore, He hasn't entered into a covenant relationship with other people. They worship other gods. Where do those other gods come from? Okay. Do we have other gods that are that are you know equal ontologically with the true God? Do they create the other gods? Do they create themselves? I mean, I don't need Deuteronomy thirty-two to raise and address any of those propositions. Oh, sure. I can use other tools to do that. Yeah, and it, it makes sense because it's logical. Right. But yet, 
I mean, how much do we hang our hat on that? <laughs> you see what I mean? And what then, is what is that in that in the sentence? The worldview. The worldview. I mean, we're building a worldview on logic, which is right. I think. I think. Flawed, I think, whether you're an ancient Israelite or us. I mean, it's going to be. We're going to have problems either way. I think when it comes to to propositional assertions about the spiritual world, and we're going to be back to your sort of your bedrock thing that we do have to take by faith. Yeah. That there is, and, and again, my my head just operates in simple ways. When I say take a proposition by faith, then mentally to defend that, I have to backtrack to things like, okay, is there a God or not? If there is, you know, then what would be true about him as opposed to things that would be less coherent to say about him? So you, 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 you sort of, I hate to use it, you, you sort of flesh out, okay, the, the person of God, you know, in, in terms of, again, who he is, his uniqueness, and all these, all these different things. And so, yeah, you build it, and it that, changes, of right, course, that, as you that's go along. All, yeah. That's all the backdrop to saying we to saying, yeah. Well, in, well, in, in, ult, in an ultimate, yeah, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Sense, you know, yeah, in an so ultimate sense, it would be. But what what I, what I'm saying is, when we taking something by faith doesn't mean it's unreasonable or even kind of unbiblical. You know what I mean? It, it, or, or irrational. You know, that, that sort of thing. That, that's all I'm going for here. Okay. Uh, I know it was directed towards Mike, but I, me and Mike, have a, I've asked that same question to Mike many times. And um, my, my uh, answer to that, I think, that's, it, that helped me because I'll, I'll just be real candid. I had huge faith issues when I started finding this stuff. Huge faith issues. Um but what uh, helped me was a robust theology of incarnation. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, is kind of a Karl Barth type view that, that, that there is a hierarchy in Revelation. Uh, not Revelation the book. The idea of God revealing himself. And that, that the, the highest form of God revealing... And well, the text says this. I, you, you don't have to get it from philosophy. That Hebrews 1 says this. That, 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 that Christ embodied... You know, God embodied in the flesh of Christ. Like, that is the ultimate revelation of who God is. So, the other forms of revelation pale in comparison to the reality of the incarnate Christ. And, and why that's significant to this particular question, I think, is because all other ways of revealing like how the spiritual world really is or like what the ontology, the reality of the beings are, like I'm writing on the celestial bodies as gods. Do I think the stars are gods? No, not at all, not even remotely. So, but it's how the ancients could have conceived them in some rough way. God didn't change their cosmology at all, but he incarnates it. And this is where Peter Inns is helpful, I think, to this to this conversation. Peter Inns wrote a book that got him fired from Westminster um, called uh, Inspiration and Incarnation. And it was Evangelicals and the Problem of the Old Testament. And he deals with these issues. And in the way he deals with them is in uh, he deals with revelation and, and, and uh, inspiration of Scripture the way the incarnation is dealt with. That just that Scripture is like the incarnation of Jesus. It's completely fully human book in every way, writing as humans of that time would have understood. Completely human, but incarnate with the Word of God. In the same way that Jesus was fully human in every way. He would have missed a free throw or stubbed his toe, you know, like, but, but he was fully God. So that, that has to go. So if we believe that to start, like as the ultimate revelation, like number one, then as we're going down the list, we have to say that the other conceptions of what is real and what isn't real about the gods or about cosmology is secondary and may not be right at times, but it's, it's how God reveals himself in that context. And so I think the, the incarnational point helps me at least deal with some of the difficult, like, man, I don't have a correspondent to reality to some of this stuff. Well, but the, in the, the revelation that's made within that context is almost more important than the details that frame it. And that's, 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 that's my answer. I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, and I, and I would I would agree that the the framing is flexible. The framing, the framing will change. Right. It it, it by of necessity it will change because if you especially if you're talking about using the natural world or again our experience to frame something, by definition that's going to change. And I th- I think actually that's why God was okay with it. In other words, He knows that the method He's allowing to operate to communicate these ideas will change. So it isn't it isn't the mode, it isn't the expression, it isn't the framing. That's those are just vehicles, those are just tools to expressing things that transcend all those other things. All, you know the way it's, it's it's framed. But Trey just just said. This place closes in an hour or so, so we need to keep moving. Oh. Anybody else with a question? Um, so you probably talked about this somewhere, and I haven't come across it, but in relation to Hebrews 3, um, the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, but then also you have this thing that through the eternal purpose of Christ, that through the church, we're supposed to be making known this manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities you know, in high places. I'm... Um, with that context, I guess I have a two-part question. One is, do you, do you have any any additional clarity on the difference between sort of the lesser divine beings that we see being judged in Psalm 82 versus the demons that Jesus is interacting with, casting out, and saying that his disciples will be marked by dealing with those? And then what do you think and what do you see is our interaction today as the church in terms of making things known to these lesser gods, these lesser divine beings, it's obviously a lot we're supposed to be telling them. Mm-hmm. What are we supposed to be communicating, uh, and what's the purpose of it? Yeah, I'll, 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 let me do the, the, the second one. I got an email yesterday, last night actually, from a guy who uh, is going to be coming to to Bellingham where I work to film me for something. I, I can't even remember what I'm supposed to be filming, but he says now, I. I was able to find a place and I looked at it online. They got pictures and it's the kind of backdrop I want. And, you know, for all these other reasons, he says, but it's in a yoga studio. So he wanted to know if I was bothered by that. So he goes, because we go into the yoga studio and they've got, you know, I, I call them like, are your pictures accurate? Because they've got the, the, the Buddhas and the, the, the idols and stuff like this. And he says, you know, what it is do we think, you know, we're, we're getting in trouble here? You know, like if, if we show up to film here is, you know, are, basically are the gods that going to get us, you know, that kind of thing. And I said, I said, I'll be thrilled to, to, to take them to task and talk about things on film that are going to undermine any goal they have. So fill the room. Okay. And I just gave him Ephesians, <laughs> the passage in Ephesians about, you know, that the powers are defeated and whatnot. It's like, to me, it, it's fun to go to a place to say things that are going to undermine them. So, like, bring it on. You know, let, let, let's do that. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I tried to, to amp it up a little bit just so that he would get the point. If you, Here we are, back to the resurrection. Because the resurrection is constantly linked with the defeat of the gods. You either believe this or you don't. Now, if I don't want to... I don't want to minimize these stories we hear like out in the mission field this place is under dominion and bad things happen and you know people get even get hurt or physically assaulted or yeah that happens because you know why it happens it happens because it's a battle okay and and i think that that part of telling the powers you know the way it is is just stuff like this if you don't go to these places if you don't assert truth in these places they're not going to learn anything Okay, they're not going to learn what they're supposed to learn. They're not going to hear what they're supposed to hear. The people aren't going to hear what they're supposed to hear. And, and so why, why should we necessarily adopt a, a sort of cringing defensive posture in, in these situations? So that, I think, again, is how I process that whole, we got a message you know, to get out there, and people aren't the only ones listening to it. They're not the only ones observing you know, what we're doing in the name of Christ, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the first part, remind me again what the first part was. Yeah, I was just asking if you had any additional clarity on the difference between the, oh, the, oh, the lesser divine and, beings yeah. from Psalm 82 and the demons that Jesus interacts with. Yeah, there, there's a little bit on this in Unseen Realm. The, 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 the quick and dirty answer is you, you have to think in terms of rebellions, We've got a rebellion in Genesis 3 that involved one you know, divine being and, of course, people. We've got another rebellion in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. 
all the traditions, whether it's Mes- the Mesopotamian backdrop with the Abkalu, whether it's Second Temple material, and you also get hints of it in the Old Testament, that those responsible for doing that in Genesis 6 are put in prison until the eschaton, the time of the end. It, it, it's very consistent. So now you got the one, you got a, a group that's in the abyss, and then you got the Babel story. So those are the, the gods of the nations. They're not these other two groups. It's a third different group of rebels. The demons that Jesus encounters, again, and, and the, 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 the traditions, the text, Old New Testament are outside, again, are, are very consistent here. That what we think of as a demon okay, is not technically, and is precisely what, what's being talked about there are the disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim. You know, they're the, the next generation of these guys. You get hints of that in the Old Testament when you see these visions of Sheol and you get the Rephaim there, that this is where the idea comes from. It gets more, again, to use the stupid pun again, fleshed out in Second Temple literature because the Second Temple literature is, is heavily dipping into the original Mesopotamian context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So now you've got four groups. Okay, you've got Satan, the Satan figure, the, the serpent. You've got the Genesis 6 dudes, the Watchers. You've got the gods of the nations. You've got, again, the disembodied you know, spirits of the Watchers, who are also called Watchers, but also called demons, and all these different groups. You have Shadim in the Old Testament is really not a demon like we think of in the Gospels. Shadim is a territorial entity. That's what the Akkadian term means. It's really referring to one of these gods of the nations, which makes perfect sense in Deuteronomy 32, because they're the ones the Israelites get seduced by. Again, it's actually a coherent picture, even though it looks messy to us because we're not familiar with the vocabulary or or the context. Yeah, about the demon issue, uh, why why that's a little complicated in the New Testament is there's more than one meaning of that term. And and, and you also get a conflation. Right. Like when you get to the Hellenistic period onward, see in the Old Testament you can take a term like malachim, angels and that that refers to like a third tier of the divine council different from the mm-hmm. sons of god in rank not ontology but in, in rank but when you get to the hellenistic period they start to use angelos the way the biblical writers would think of elohim 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 is the generic word for spiritual being angelos becomes that for the good guys the bad guys you get daimon and daimonion which are neutral terms they are right, but especially when it, when they're pluralized, it's the bad guys, and so you get this conflation of, of the terminology. So th- this th- this is really important that they're neutral terms because th- there's there's two main senses mm-hmm. that the New Testament will use that daimon term, the de- demon term, is one in the gos- when you're talking about the gospels, and this is really important. Is I think the Enochic background is behind those particular demons. Me and Mike agree on that. It, but and the, and the plural is important. But yeah, the demons groups. plural. Yeah. But the narrative, the way the narrative frames them, is really important. And how narrative, uh, how historiography works in Greek is, you can front load the title of a being in the beginning with adjectives, and you don't have to repeat them later, right? Like if I've told you once what they are. I'm not going to tell you like 20 more times. Like, so when you're going through the Gospels, take Luke, for example. Mm-hmm. Luke, at the first uh, uh, casting out of a daimon in Luke 4, what you have is um, the, the narrator telling you that this is an evil, unclean spirit. So because in Greek world, if you're hearing this in the Greek world, you, there's good daimons, there's not just apathetic daimons there's you know there's just it's a plethora of different ones but these are particular the evil and unclean spirits and so that's the one form of daimon but then the other one that paul uses and is not the same as the gospels when paul uses the term demon in first corinthians 10 and this is very important distinction this is not what the gospels are talking about yeah that that's the, that's the exception the, because of what yeah. he's quoting. Go ahead. These are the these are the yeah. lower tier gods, and if you think that this is just a 
uh, an Old Testament thing. It's not. Because in the in the Hellenistic world, they thought they used the term the daimonis for these lower tier deities as well. Uh, in Plato, in Plato's Laws, he has a, it's written like a discourse where where you have like three people talking to each other, and um, uh, the Athenian talks about how Kronos, the high god of time, established kind of like how the earthly dominions would work, and he says that. Kronos, in his wisdom, saw that um, humans left to their own devices would just end up killing each other. <laughs> and they need to be ruled over just like humans rule over goats or beasts. And so they're the daimons. So those are those spirits that are placed over different territories of peoples to rule over them. And when the Septuagint comes along, the Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible... And they're trying to relate these concepts in the Greek world in Deuteronomy 32, which mentions the gods that they went after in, mm-hmm. the, in the wilderness. The Septuagint translate those the daimones. Yeah. Because the, in Greek world, they already have categories. They know what territorial spirits are. So, so it's an easy translation for them. They, they, they would understand that. Um, so, so it's really important to know that th- th- that term can cover any one of these beings. And, um, and, and you can tell that Paul yeah. is thinking of that concept because he quotes Deuteronomy 32. It, yeah, he literally quotes Deuteronomy yeah. 32, 17 there, which is the territorial spirits of the diamonds. So, yeah. So just to be super clear, to go back to the first part of your answer, when it comes to what we are supposed to be making known to these rulers and authorities, it's really nothing more than just a proclamation. I mean, I th- is that think, what you're saying? I think it's the proclamation of, of what happened at the cross and the resurrection. You know, again, a remind a reminder of, of what the what the story is now. And if you think about the gods, you know, the of, of the nations in particular, the resurrection means that Okay, you had we had this system in biblical thinking where God Himself set this system up. Okay, because as a punishment at Babel, disinheriting you, I'm taking Abraham and I'm going to make my own nation. You guys get these guys. And this one's allotted to this and all that. And so a Gentile, you know, who and and this was even part of their own literature. They don't have to be reading the Septuagint to get this. They're thinking, well. I'm supposed to worship these other gods. If I don't do that, then, you know, I'm going to get hit by the thunderbolt or the world's going to descend into chaos or, or whatever. And, and, and so what essentially what Paul's telling the Gentile is, look, the God who set this up and punished you with it is now saying the authority, their authority to rule over you is over. It's done. I'm not only saying you're allowed to forsake them, I'm demanding it. I'm saying it's time for you to come back into my family. They have no, if we want to use this kind of terminology, they have no legal authority to demand your worship. So tell them to, you know, go straight to you know where. I mean, it, he, he's demanding, he's demanding that they, they move back into the family by embracing the, the risen Messiah. So that is part of the messaging. You know, in, you, if we want to just focus on them, you might call that reversing Herman. Do I, what about reversing? You might Herman? call that reversing yeah. Herman. It is, and 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 again, I, I go into a lot of the, the details of this in that in that book, which is going to be out in February or March. But reversal is a big deal because as as we, I mean, think about what what all this means. We talk about mirroring and reversing. Yeah. Okay, so so whether you're Jew or Gentile, but let, let's just think about Gentiles. So. I'm going to abandon these gods that, that you, you Jews out there said we're supposed to be worshiping them, you know, because your God set this up. But, but now you're saying that, that that God came to earth incarnate in Christ, died and, and rose again. And now I don't have to, I'm, I'm not bound. I'm not under bondage to these other gods who, who frankly, you know, again, as things are chaotic on earth, that's, that's a reflection of, of their attitude toward, or toward the people they rule. So as I enter into the kingdom, their kingdom diminishes. As I will inherit even already but not yet the resurrection status, I will live, but they will die. They will be destroyed. 
you know, because that's ultimately where the eschaton leads. So you have all these already but not yet and these reversal themes that are that are really tied to what we call the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and its reversal because of the resurrection. And, and Paul, and he's not the only one, New Testament writers are tracking on how one thing counteracts the other. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I think, I think your question was great because when, when you're saying, what are we supposed to be announcing, right? That w- announcing the kingdom of God, the reign of the, the God of Israel is literally the opposite of, of all these other gods rule and territory. And what's interesting here is in, in Hebrews, and that's not the only place, especially in Romans, uh, really, uh, really big in Romans is, not all Jews, uh, most Jews who are like really urbane, sophisticated Jews would think Paul's a lunatic because um, what are you going around telling these Gentiles not to worship their gods for? It's fine. They can worship them. A lot of Jews thought that was OK, like that, that the other Gentiles can worship their gods because, look. The Most High gave them over. Just let them, you know, let them do their thing. And and they may go to texts like Deuteronomy that says, and God apportion, you know, the gods over the nations. But if you look in Deuteronomy, there's no condemnation of the other nations to do that. I'll go through there. And what's interesting, the Septuagint, Paula Friedrichson. Yeah, Paul, like the Psalm 82, eight, I, the Isaiah passage that links the resurrection with with taking the nation. Right. Yeah. But some Jews didn't read those. They didn't pay attention right, to those right. texts. Yeah. We, we'll, They're like, we'll eh, we out. don't like that <laughs> stuff. We're not a crazy apocalypticist, you know. Uh, we're more sophisticated Greeks, you know. Uh, well, uh, I don't know why I did this. <laughs> that's that's weird. That I don't think they did that, but whatever. Um, so... Uh, uh, the, w- one thing... One, one reasons why they wouldn't... They would they would hate Paul and these other guys who are going around announcing the kingdom of the one God taking these nations back is because in the Septuagint, I'm getting this from Paula Friedrichsen, a scholar from Boston college and a lecturer at Hebrew university in Jerusalem. She, she has a very interesting, and actually this goes, it, it's really fascinating uh, how much some scholars are now talking about this. It, yeah. It, it, I, that, I, that you've been talking about forever. I can't, I, I was in some session yesterday and that thought hit me. Like, yeah. this is just kind of weird. Paula like, Friedrichsen, I, this I mean, now. talks, has a lecture. You can find it on YouTube of, uh, uh, Paul Judaizing the Gentiles or something like that. Or mm. Paul's gospel, something about Paul's gospel. Look up Paula Friedrichsen and Paul, you'll find it. Um, and, uh, she talks about how, um, the, he's Judaizing these Gentiles because he he's having them worship the Gen, the Jewish God and leave their gods behind. But but in the Septuagint translation of Exodus, and and I don't remember the chapter and verse right off the top of my head because uh, Septuagint is different than the Hebrew on this. That uh, when when there's there's a passage that says, "Do not blaspheme God," or "Do not you know," uh, which blaspheme doesn't mean like you're not God. It just means like don't bring uh, a reproach on the deity, right? Like, don't be a jerk, you know? Um, th- that, that, when you translate that into Greek, they said, do not blaspheme the gods. And it was theos, plural. And the way some, a lot of Greek Jews interpreted this was, if you're going to pagan cities in, in the Greco-Roman world, this is really important because it has implications for us right now. Uh, when they would go into pagan cities, Jews who believe in the one God and worship the one God, right? If you if you're going into pagan cities, one of the things you do, this is just what you do to be a social good person, is each of these cities has their own patron deities, they have their own temples, and that's where all the big festivals are. That's where the parties are. The best craft beer is there. Like the, the, you know, there's all kinds of temple prostitutes for you to have fun with and all that. So you go to these cities and you're invited to these big, if you're some sort of, you know, let's say you're a pretty well to do Jew and you're going along the Roman road and you're visiting Ephesus or you're visiting Corinth and Hey, come to the temple of Asclepius. We have this great banquet. It's of the fourth month of whatever. And we're celebrating Asclepius today and we're going to have a great feast and sacrifice food to him. And, and they're going to sing worship songs to him. And it'll be a great party. And Jews wouldn't go. And they're like, those unsocial jerks, you know, they're like the the little separatist weirdos, you know, they're like, oh, there's only one God. And that's where the term atheoi 
where, what we call atheist comes from. The Greeks, that's a Greek term that the Romans would call, and Greeks before the Romans, would call Jews. They would call them atheoi. They didn't believe in the gods. They didn't honor the gods. But some Jews would take the Septuagint translation to mean like, look, when you're in another city, don't blaspheme the gods. Go to the banquets. It's fine. Just be a good dude, you know? And so some of them would think, that's cool. You know, just go... Eat the food, you know, put before you. Just be be cool. Don't be a jerk about it. Yeah, you have the one God, but don't go blowing it in people's faces. New Testament says quite the opposite. New Testament's like, nope, all of you are wrong. <laughs> this is the time. The time is at hand. The reign of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means the death of the gods. And some of these Jews would be like, what the heck? Why do they need to die? Give them a break. But we do we not do we not have this same problem today? Like in, in this sense, this is why I think it's so important to know these things about history, because when we're talking about preaching the gospel today. Right. And you go somewhere like that. Some people may not know the gospel or they have some really weird view of the gospel and you're trying to correct it. And you're calling someone to repent when you call someone to repent and, and believe the gospel, the good news, and you're announcing, Hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is Lord of the world right now, as we're talking and breathing his air, people will get pissed because you're saying, well, Oh, so yours is the only way yours is the only truth. We can't have our truth too. Right? So this isn't new. People think that in the modern and postmodern world, this is some new thing. Like, Oh, you know, we're pluralist, you know, you can believe whatever you want. It's fine. The, people were saying that in Rome. This is not new. <laughs> Don't buy this stuff like, oh, we're this sophisticated post enlightenment modern world. Who knows all this religion stuff is silly. In the ancient world, they were saying the same thing of Christians and Jews. So the, don't buy that malarkey for one second. Uh, the, the gospel still has the same power now as it had then. And, and, it, and it was delivering people who had worshipped these gods in the temples all the time had just miraculously stopped and worship the one God because something happened to them. And so I think that's a really important background to this. I, I think. Mm -hmm. So the question is probably directed to both of you guys. It revolves around the uh, Deuteronomy 32 worldview that we sort of been discussing, right? The, um, in particular, when, when you're talking about the Elohim that were, you know, God's like, I wash my hands of you guys because, you essentially turned your back on me and started doing things you're not supposed to. And now I'm placing these Elohim over your, you know, you, you're going to go over here to the Amorites, right? And you're going to go to Canaan, all these guys, right? So when, when you think about particularly Hellenistic Greek, you know, forget about which Artemis we're talking about or Demeter or Apollo, Zeus, pick the God. Is that going to be the same uh, in the Hebrew, the Elohim that was placed over that group. And then if we go east towards, uh, you know, the Asian countries, the, you know, China, at the time Mongolia and what's now Japan, they had a totally different setup. Are, are we, can we make the connection between the Hebrew Elohim in all those cases? You know, Artemis was an Elohim and... Uh, you know, the ancestry worship that you have going on in Shinto that also was an Elohim. Yeah, I, I th Elohim is is sufficiently elastic to incorporate all of that. You know, how, how people talked about Elohim is spirit beings, okay? mm -hmm. how people conceived those spirit beings, how they talked about them varies widely by culture. Now, there, there's some consistency. Oh, there must be a hierarchy. You know, some must be calling the shots. Some must be more powerful than the other. So all of that gets, you know, projected and articulated and conceived uh, by analogy again. But the how they're talked about, there's there's going to be again difference and differentiation and disconnect between cultures. That that's pretty obvious. But what they are is still this spiritual being that is in in a rebellion state against Yahweh. That, that sort of thing. So, you know, and, and, and think about the names. A lot of them are related to geography. A lot of them are related to some perceived attribute, maybe some event that happens in a particular place or whatever. There's any number of reasons why a deity would get called certain things and associated with certain places. Um, 
you know, but but again, that that's that's how humans are processing these divine presences, as opposed to the the ontology of the presences themselves. I don't uh, I don't know if the Bible says anything about that. So because in the in the the ancient you know Jewish narrative, the seventy nations are just that basically the ancient Mediterranean world, yeah. you know, like in a disc, like Spain being the ends of one end, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, See, I, my, uh, my quirky... Northern even, Africa on the other end, you know, it's like, so I don't think they even know about China. <laughs> you know, it's like, right, I, right, right. so, I they, mean... They, they don't. And this this is actually my sort of odd view of why the Perusia was delayed. Because I think the Perusia is delayed... It's directly related to the concept of the fullness of the Gentiles. Oh, interesting. Okay, God knows the world is a whole lot bigger than the world of Genesis 10. Okay, and, and the disciples, I mean, this was their world. This is what they knew, but, but God knows better. And so if you're going to include people everywhere who are not Israel, in other words, they're not, they're not in this unique relationship, and, that, and this relationship is supposed to abound to all other nations and all that kind of stuff, God knows what the real picture is. And so the fullness of the Gentiles could not be fulfilled in, in just that limited space. But they don't, have, they don't necessarily know that. They, they really they don't know that. So again, that, that's, that's, my view is probably a little idiosyncratic. Yeah. But I, I'm attaching it to that phrase, which, which can't be denied. Okay, that, that is a key element to the whole eschatological outwork. Yeah, and the, but I think there's two... I think there's a distinction that needs to be made there because I don't believe that the historical Paul knew anything about those nations mm-hmm. or knew anything about the fact that they needed to be saved or whatever. But yeah, the, I don't. I don't think he did either. Yeah, but, yeah, but but it's like one of those things where the I guess you would categorize it as progressive revelation. I guess. The, I, well, the, I, the, I would I would say that God knew what His plan was. Right, right, right. You know, so, and, he, and he doesn't he doesn't hold Paul accountable for for knowledge that he couldn't possibly have had. Right, but Paul will say like, "I've reached the whole world." Right, in his mind, this is his mission. the seventy. The, the way the map yeah. is, he thinks he has. Right, you know, he, he thinks this is this is his job. Yeah, Tarshish, Spain was the end yeah. of the map. Yeah, like the end of the yeah, world for him. Far, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the so I, I mean, this is what my paper is on Monday, actually. Is that uh, when when Paul talks about the resurrection, he doesn't actually use that term often. People think that's what he's talking about all the time, but he doesn't. He only uses it in a nominal form where he's describing the event. And what God does, it's a gyro, it's raising them up. And and I talk about this in the podcast before, but the event um, of the resurrection, part of that was destroying the rulers, the principalities and powers, which goes back to Psalm 82. So that's Psalm 82 is the destruction of the gods at the arising of the divine figure. And, and early Jews were already saying this stuff before Jesus. Like 11 Q Melchizedek at Qumran has the Melchizedek figure of Psalm 110 is the, the Psalm 82 figure who destroys the gods. And what does Paul quote in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28 about God who arises to destroy the rulers and principalities and powers? He quotes Psalm 110. He, he, he quotes the same passage saying, saying that he, he'll make an enemy a footstool for his feet. So, so Paul thinks that this is happening right now in Jesus. Like that Jesus right now upon his resurrection, that's the role. He's destroying those principalities and powers so that ethne, the nations that are allotted to them, he can legitimately tell them, hey, you're free. Like you're like legitimately free. Like the, the, the God's rule is at hand and you're literally liberated, not some sort of like, you know, you feel good about in your spirit because God saved you. Yeah, you'll be. Yeah, you'll get excited, but some days will suck and you'll cry, you know. <laughs> so it's 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 more the reality that spiritually and ontologically, there is nothing that enslaves them anymore. And so that goes back to his question earlier is that's what we're announcing. You announce that in China, you announce that in native tribes in the Americas, um, which the Europeans were horrible and did not represent the gospel when they slaughtered natives. This is completely contrary to the kingdom of God. Um, not, not in the Bible. Yeah, it, in the the biblical no. description is limited because yeah. of, because of the knowledge of the writers. Is limited. You know, if you're asking if if you're if you're framing the question as 
that the concept of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is to set Yahweh against all other beings that are hostile to him and his people against those who are not his people, well, that, then it does apply. But if you ask Paul, Paul would say, well, I know what the job is. and I got to yeah. get to Spain, you know, because that's what he knows. And God doesn't expect him to know something he can't know. And God's fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're gonna they're gonna have they're gonna have similar ideas because they're gonna have some of the cultures are gonna have similar cosmology. Well, when you when you if you're it's hard to frame these things in heaven and hell kind of terminology, but it, the good place would be where the gods are. Well, the, the gods are up there where, where we don't live. All that sort of stuff, and so when you die, since you're put into the ground in a lot of cultures, that's typically the realm of the dead. And again, you, 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 you these places don't have latitude and longitude, but the conception of heavenly versus this is where we get buried—that's pretty consistent in, in, in a lot of places. Not everyone, but it's pretty consistent. So there's the, the realm of that we hope to go to, and then there's the realm you know that we don't want to stay there. You know, we, we don't want, want to end up there. So there's a lot of overlap in in terms of the cosmology that's going to in, in a cultural engagement you can map some of that over uh, and and then again you know the whole idea of there being divine beings a populated an animate spiritual world again that maps over real real nicely what what's different about you you going and presenting you know a, a, a gospel message to one of these other cultures is you are free from, again, worshiping these other gods because of the incarnation, because of this event, you know, the, the death and the resurrection and all that sort of stuff. So that, that's, that's the element that is news. That's the different thing uh, that, that you're, we're tasked with taking them to. But this, this isn't to make light of the problem. I mean, it, is, it was historically a very difficult problem. Like, of, you know, what do we do about the nations that aren't in Scripture, you know, that are out there. But I agree with Mike that, that in, in terms of conceptually, it's easy to think of that, okay, well, then there's more to do. You know, there's more work to be done um, yeah, and, and I, to I, reach the ends of the earth. I would add, but, if, if, if God thought it was necessary to communicate to every piece of turf, okay, he would have waited till like, when we had the Internet. You know, to give us revelation. You know what I mean? He, there would have been some human mechanism by which he would meet that goal. But, you know, apparently because of what we have, God didn't care that that was immediately known or immediately accomplished. He knew how it would be accomplished through people, okay, through imagers, through, you know, members of his family. And God likes that. He likes us to participate in the task and enjoy the results and all this sort of, you know, these big picture theological concepts you see from the very beginning. So I like to say these are God's choices, and I, I'm not going to I'm not going to sit in judgment on God's choices. Well, it would have been better if you had done. No, we're, we're going to let God work the program like God wants to work the program, and believe that He knows what He's doing and it'll get done. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, I have one. I'd be remiss not to mention um, my brother and I go back. Me and Jeremiah go back and forth about. Uh, and I know you guys joke about uh, prophecy. Uh, this is not necessarily, we don't need a detailed, I don't need a detailed answer, but uh, just a place to start. And this might have even been mentioned in a previous episode about the role that Israel might play in the end times. Uh, I know it's a massive subject. Uh, uh, if, if, if that's somewhere else in another episode you can point me to, um, I have a second question uh, that might be a little bit easier. Uh, goes back about demons, but uh, we can start with with uh, Israel. Well, I I think Israel has some role just because of the way we have events like Armageddon described, the Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly, which is Zion. I mean, the these are terms, you know, that you know have a have a geographical context. Now, yeah, there's a heavenly Zion and all that sort of thing, but that's also part of the picture in Revelation. But there are other passages where. There are events that are clearly portrayed as happening on Earth. So, what would the earthly Zion would be? Well, probably the Zion of the Old Testament. You know, they're just things like that. That I, I, I say it very broadly. That piece of turf has some role to play in the outworking of the eschaton. You know, something like that. 
I don't really like the, the schemes and the systems and, you know, the charts and, and all that sort of thing because they're all, they all look beautiful until you compare them to, to something else, you know, to a different view because everybody sort of hi- hides the outliers. You know, they, I like to say they cheat. Um, and, and my, my own view is that you can't avoid that because I think pro- mess, I thought messianic prophecy was deliberately cryptic. I think it's going to be the same way the second time around. We will only understand these things in hindsight. So while it's part of scripture, yeah, we want to study that. We want to try to come to grips with what, what the end game is at least. And the, the kind of stuff we're talking about here tonight is very end game oriented. Um, I, you know, do that. But if, if you're trying to, if you're trying to marry, um, if you're trying to create a system that is going to answer every question, um, I, I don't think really think that's a good use of, of Bible study time. And again, that's just me because I think it's going to work the same way it worked the first time around. But you're only going to understand what all this means in hindsight. And just to add a book that might be helpful in how to begin to reread certain prophetic texts uh, with kind of an ancient lens that isn't always predictive in the sense that most people mean prophecy is like, this means this event, this means this event. There's a book by Brent Sandy called uh, Plowshares and Pruning Hooks. And it's it's that, that one got him fired ultimately. Too. Oh, it got him not surprised. <laughs> Golly. Uh, um, well, the book's great. <laughs> I mean, the book, it helps you uh, see how, that a lot of prophetic texts that we would kind of kind of de ethicize. I might if that's even a word um, is 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 pushing people into a way of life in a way of being that's vindicated in the, in, in, in the eschaton rather than predicting timelines. And, and, and he does a great job of showing how that works in, in its ancient Hebrew context. But I really recommend that book because it helped me in my undergrad when I was asking those same questions. I, I read that book and it, uh, from a Hebrew prof that said, that told me to read it, and I, it yeah, that, helped me a lot. It, so. It's a very readable book because Brent used that yeah, in his undergrad read. classes where he taught at Grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, uh, the second one was about uh, uh, demons, but more in reference to the the spirits of uh, the the hybrid um, relation between uh, fallen angels or or uh, or uh, spiritual beings and humans. Uh, they were released back into the earth and my question is why would uh why would god allow them to just roam around being jerks still <laughs> yeah why would well, he it, would why wouldn't he just destroy them as opposed to just letting them run around here yeah i i tend to file this on, on why doesn't god just destroy everybody who does evil every all the jerks which would of course include all of us you, you know again I, I think this I actually think it goes back to Genesis again where where we have imagers that not they're not only just us and we got to remember the plurals you know the, the you know non-human spirits also are you know were created as his imager like him sharing his attributes all this stuff part of that is free will and so my the way I I always sort of explain this is that God is not willing to cheat he's not willing to scrap the original plan and the original setup so that so that he can win early, <laughs> okay. So he he's going to let it play out. He's big enough to let it play out, and you know keep kicking the can down the road. And, and remnant part remnant theology is part of this. God's never going to let it die completely. If he has to intervene, he's he's going to do that. But he is going to let it play out and is big enough to win, allowing this sort of chaotic you know, sort of, you know, set of conditions rather than just saying, well, you know, I'm kind of tired of this. Just, you know, don't ever talk to me like that again. If you've ever seen time bands where he just blows up all the evil ones, you know, he's, he's not going to do that. He's committed to the original plan. And I, I actually always think of Job because yeah, God could do that. But if he does that, then, you know, in, a, in an existential sense, his judgment 
the questioning his judgment is on the table. Was this a bad idea to begin with? Couldn't you think of something better? You know, all these questions. Yeah. So I think he has to let it play out. I think I think he hit something, hit a vein that is super, super deep theological stuff when we talk about um I, I love the question. It is a fantastic question. Is why let them roam? Is is because and I didn't have an answer to this until I started reading George Eldon Ladd um, uh, in my New Testament theology class. And I had a professor by the name of uh, Dr. Roy Metz at Criswell who changed my life. Um, and he uh, who taught that the gospel is about the kingdom of God. It's not about individuals, you know, sorts of salvations. It's that salvation comes through the reign of God being manifest. And what's critical about this is, well, why has he let them reign? Why has he let them reign? Because the way that God rules is fundamentally, or the way that it's revealed ultimately, not like in some passages in the Old Testament, but ultimately and climactically is through nonviolent, non-coercive means. So that when, when Jesus comes on the scene and the spirits, what do the spirits ask him? The, 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 when the spirits co- ask him, they're cast him out. They, they ask him, are, have you come to destroy us before the appointed time? So, so now, mind you, what has he already announced at that point? He's already announced that the kingdom of God is at hand, right? So in all conceptions, this is so important. This blew my mind when I actually got it. Uh, was why th- that's a really great question if you're a Jew like and the spirits are asking you that because you're thinking when the kingdom of a god comes this is a completely 110% irresistible event everyone will bow the knee if not you're toast all the spirits will be killed immediately is you, you're just going to put your face in the sand before Yahweh the lord of hosts right but but that's not how it was revealed now, here's the problem with dispensational theology. Sorry if you're dispy. I'm going to crush your hopes and dreams for a minute. Um, um, so uh, th- this, is, this is why people, if you're unfamiliar with dispensational theology, a lot of listeners are going to be really mad at me right now. Um, but uh, I'm obviously not a dispensationalist. But the, the reason why that developed it, it about only 200 years ago, by the way, um, uh, was you have this hard reaction that, that – well, the kingdom of God was promised to Israel, but they didn't accept it. So it's got put, put on the back burner, right? Maybe some of you have heard this before. Why would someone think that, though? The reason why someone would think that is because the kingdom of God didn't show up the way that they thought kingdoms should show up. This is critical. This is, this is so critical, and it plays right into your question. Because even the spirits are asking, so you come to destroy us now, right? And so, and even the and even the the people when they're waving palm fronds, they're thinking, "Man, son of David's here. He's going to kill everybody." And what does he do? He dies. So, so the, when God reveals how He rules, this is so. This is this will save people's lives. It, when when God reveals how He rules the world, guess what? It's not like the kingdoms of this world. Because what do the kingdoms of this world do? What does Jesus say? What do the Gentile kings do? They lord it over them. They take it by force. They take it by sword. Because Caesar has a good news too. He has a gospel. It's the same terms. that He has a good news. They'll send his angeloi, his messengers out. And guess what they'll tell their Germanic tribes? They'll say, hey, the good news of Caesar, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, he'll bring peace to the whole cosmos. That all it's for him and through him and to him and blah, blah. Literally the same terms. I, I'm not kidding. Same Greek terms. Um, the, and, but what, what happens if they don't repent? Slaughtered. You know, you kill them all, right? Just, yeah, good news, good news. We're going to kill you all and take your women and stuff. Yeah, not so good news, right? So, but that when the good news is manifest of the kingdom of God, it is fundamentally not coercive. The, the God is a king like a good servant. That when Jesus at the meal, and this is the climax of the gospels, is the passion narratives, where, where Jesus says, how do they rule over you? They lord it over you. But how did I come to you? 
Remember, he says, I came to you as a servant, right? This is fundamentally how he rules. So if he's just going around destroying everything, what difference is he than Zeus and everybody else? It's that fundamentally he's a, he's a God of love before anything else. And that that demonstration of love, which is what Paul says the coming of Christ is, it's a demonstration of God's love for the world, that, that he doesn't destroy us, that while we're still sinning, Christ dies for us. Not like once we repent and get right and everyone puts their face in the ground. And, and, and we are supposed to, we're both supposed to mimic Christ in the yes. same way. And Jesus himself says, all the stuff that happened to me is going to happen to you. So, like, don't be surprised. Again, this is the mechanism. It's very, it's very contrary, again, to what you'd think. How does this affect the view of the annihilist view of, uh, the annihilist view of hell? How, how would, it, how would this, this same idea affect the view that, uh, that some people believe that when you die uh, and you go to hell that you're basically destroyed? Would this affect that same, same thought process? Well, I, I would say that you, the, the result of that is you do not have eternal life in the family of God. I mean, in other words, it's the same outcome as if you took a, a non-annihilationist view of hell. In other words, there's an eternal separation from the family of God. So they, they, they both result in the same thing, you know, ultimately. You're, you're supposed to be coming back to the family, coming back to the source of life. You're going back to Eden. You're going to live there forever. You know, you, the new heaven and new earth, this is going to be your home. You know, all these things that were supposed to be originally, now we're at the end, and things come full circle. If you're not in the family of God, you don't inherit any of that. So whether you're annihilated or whether you're, you know, in an eternal hell, or the the impact is the same, the effect is the same, the loss, you know, in, in terms of what you don't have, is the same. So th- um, I think that that's a big part of that. I, in, in other words, it, it functions in both models, and one isn't sort of violative of those ideas as opposed to the other. Yeah, I would I, take it just one step further. I think. Um, it's not necessarily contradicting what, what Mike's saying in any way, but to take it the next step further, I do think there is a fundamental difference between eternal torment and annihilation. Like, I don't think it's just like, well, they just don't inherit because one, you have a God that eternally torments someone. And then one, you have a God that doesn't. And so, uh, I'm particularly, uh, uh, would hold to the annihilation view, um, I think it's more consistent with certain characteristics of God in, in the in the New Testament and in the Old, especially the end of Isaiah. I think the end of Isaiah was important for me, is that when the leeches never depart from the bodies that are laid out in the in the field, you know, and the on the land, that's not meaning like they're eternally being eaten, it's meaning they're never coming back. And so and I think the same image in apocalyptic is used. Mm-hmm. I, I I'm obviously not the only one that says this, but again, I don't know for sure. And I don't think well, I don't know. Some people say we can know for sure, but I think it's against the character of God in the same kind of a way that we see like um, dealings with like children or people that don't know or Mm -hmm. stuff like that. I think it's similar, not the same, not the same. But one thing I can say for sure is that the, the main issues in terms of people's destinies in their response to the, to the proclamation of the kingdom was determined on their rejection or not. Because I can't really say that much about, I'm not a Calvinist, so I can't say that much about those who don't know. But, but, uh, um, but for those that openly reject and willfully reject, I can tell you there's no hope for you. I, I yeah, mean, I, I, I take, if you've, if you follow the podcast through Q and a, I've gotten the, the hell question before. And for me, you know, the, the annihilation view, I think both views are on the table for kind of the, what, what David said, you know, that it's kind of hard to know com- with complete certainty, you know, where to land. But for me, the, the thing that makes annihilation coherent is the language about the death of death. You know, the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. So if that's true, in other words, if you take that at face value, then how, do, how can you still have somebody that's perpetually like in the dying process? So, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't solve the issue. 
you know, it, with any completeness because you could say, well, that's just metaphorical and it fits over here this way. I, I get that. But I think that language has to be dealt with. And, and it's, it's sort of there for a reason. But ultimately, the, the effect, our, our lack of omniscience on that point doesn't change the outcome in, in either respect. Right. Question about the Herman um, Bashan stuff. Um, the uh, well, for one, I'm I'm kind of bugged that I've preached and been there four times, taught on it, and all before I read the Unseen Realm because I I never knew the sort of paperfold connection. <laughs> but um, the uh, when Paul I know when Paul um, X nine uh, is on the way to Damascus that you're probably going to go through Bashan area. Um, and then Acts 26, when he talks uh, to Agrippa about um, how he had proclaimed in Damascus um, and then uh, you know, Jerusalem to mm-hmm. you know, the Gentiles, do you think there is there any connection? Is Acts playing on that? I don't know if the area of Bashan extended that far up. Well, that, I, Damascus. if you remember the, the Acts series, I think the reason Damascus is included in the in the narrative in Acts is because of the language back to Abraham, every place upon which your feet tread. Okay. Now, it, it's a little bit different with Abraham, but it, the gist of that statement is repeated two or three times in the Old Testament, and and you get this language of where your where your feet tread. That's what that's your land. That's what you're going to inherit. And so, Abraham gets to that point. That is the northernmost point before you get to the land divisions and all that stuff, uh, when he chases the captors of Lot. That's where he ends up. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that, that is, that's theological messaging to say that, you know, because you're in this pattern, we're taking this, this message of the Jewish Messiah to the Jew first. And that's part of, of gobbling up all the places that would have been conceived of as Israelite Jewish turf before we shift to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why Damascus is, is in that. Not not so much Bashan okay. itself, but, yeah. but I think that's the connection point. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have a question real quick? We've got about three minutes. I know they're closing here. Out of all the uh, divine realm or divine council stuff that you've covered, is there any one particular area you think needs more research, more <laughs> looking at? Or that you would love to, but you don't have time. Put it that well, way. I, I would answer that by saying, go to moreunseenrealm.com and click on the tab that says "What's Next," because there's there's probably fifteen, twenty, a couple dozen places, either that you can drill down on or that I never got to in the book. So I'll answer it that way. Yeah, there's a lot to do. Unseen realm is just the lay of the land. Th- these are the orientation points where if you if you see it, you're not going to be able to unsee it because you will see it everywhere. You'll just you'll see the threads and the connections. And so that was the goal. So there's a lot yet to cover. Ask one more, but it's not you don't have to give a long answer. Yeah, real make, quick. It's possible to give a short answer to this. It's a complicated question, but oh, hold on. Don't, don't give me a long answer. Just Yes. No. Okay. So if <laughs> if the gods are losing right now, okay, that's the that's the message that you're oh, kind of presenting I'm, to everything. I'm, the the riff on this is already forming in my head. So but if the gods are losing right now, then how does the Antichrist rise up in the end? I I approach this this way that that we tend to think that God is only at work or God only shows up in the overt and the spectacular. I think the gods are losing. I think the kingdom is advancing. But most of the time, what, what got, even in Scripture, frankly, you know, you don't have a miracle on every page, you know, this, this kind of thing. And in, in the life of the early church, yeah, you had spectacular things happen, but most of the day-to-day stuff was people doing what they're supposed to do God providentially again moving the plan along, so I think I think we need to have a, a, a big view of providence. That most of the time, what God, the evidence that God is working, is not going to be overt and spectacular. It's going to be the unseen hand, and it's easy for us as Americans in the West, and you know, sort of the way the culture is dipping into a post-Christian era, to think, oh, you know, the, the bad guys are winning. 
Well, I got news for you. There are other places in the world where the church, even under persecution, is a mighty thing. I mean, it, that, that's just the way it is. But again, you know, we, we see the, the ballooning of the church like in China or, or, the, or Muslim countries or something like that. Some of that is overt, but a lot of it is just people. It's the Bill Belichick approach to biblical theology. Just do your job, you know, and, and it'll get done. And so I, why, why will Antichrist rise? Well, Antichrist will rise because the, the bad guys are not going to go without a fight. Okay, right. It, it's it's not linked to who's winning or losing or, you know, we're losing enough or we're winning enough. It, they're not going to go without a fight. They know what they're in. And remember when the good news is announced, somebody gets crucified. Yeah. <laughs> remember that. <laughs> yep. You know, this that's, that's been the M.O. since the beginning. Those who suffer with him will be glorified with him. All right. I think that's a good place to stop. So uh, yeah. th- answer your question. What needs to happen next is we're trying to get him to do this full time so we can get to some <laughs> of those answers because I don't want to wait another 10 years for unseen round two. I know I repeat myself. I but, get I get this lecture all the time. Yeah, well, so. You know, we're, 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 we're working towards it and we certainly we couldn't do it if it wasn't for y'all, too. So we certainly appreciate yeah, absolutely everybody. Just for everything y'all do, contributing to being here tonight and telling your friends and family about, you know, Mike and David's content and the show and all this good stuff. And so, you know, I want to thank everybody for coming again and thank everybody else out there who's not here who listens and support us. And we certainly appreciate it. And uh, I guess with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Good job. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.